Section 1 of Dallam's Travels with an Organ to the Grand Seigneur, 1599-1600, by Thomas Dallam. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson the diary of master thomas dallam fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred in this book is the account of an organ carried to the grand seigneur and other curious matters fifteen ninety nine necessaries for my voyage into turkey the which i bought upon very short warning having no friend to advise me in anything in primus for one suit of sackcloth to wear at sea one pound two shillings item for another suit of kersey one pound eighteen shillings item for two waistcoats of flannel eight shillings item for a hat seven shillings sixpence item for an arming sword six shillings item for a chest nine shillings eight pence item for three shirts eighteen shillings six pence item for one dozen of bands twelve shillings eight pence item for half a dozen of bands ten shillings item for one band two shillings six pence item for six shirts more one pound fourteen shillings item for one dozen of handkerchiefs ten shillings item for one pair of garters four shillings item for one dozen of points laces for fastening clothes one shilling item for another dozen two shillings item for two pair of stockings twelve shillings item for one pair of linen breeches one shilling four pence item for one pair of pumps and pantoffles three shillings sixpence item for three pair of shoes seven shillings item for a girdle and hangers that part of the sword belt to which the weapon was suspended two shillings eight pence item for a gown one pound ten shillings item for a pair of virginals spinets one pound fifteen shillings item for a pair of fustian breeches two shillings six pence item for a hat band four shillings two pence item for another hat band one shilling for a cellar and glasses eleven shillings six pence item for rosa solis a cordial and a compost a mixture six shillings item for oil and vinegar two shillings item for prunes one shilling three pence item for raisins of the sun sun-dried raisins one shilling four pence item for cloves mace and pepper one shilling six pence item for two pounds of sugar three shillings item for nutmegs one shilling item for gloves three shillings item for knives five shillings item for thirty pounds of tin in bars eighteen shillings item for a gross of spoons nine shillings item for oatmeal ten pence item for carrying my chest to black whale one shilling six pence item for my passage to gravesend six pence item for my staying there four days it cost me twelve shillings item at deal castle one shilling item at dartmouth four shillings at plymouth staying there seven days it cost me fifteen shillings at algiers in barbary four shillings at zante in grecia no price at Scandaroon in Asia Minor, no price. From the Land's End of England, 
to the strait's mouth is four hundred leagues betwixt the strait's mouth and algiers in barbary is one hundred and fifty leagues from algiers to sicily is two hundred leagues from sicily to zante is ninety leagues from zante to scandaroon is two hundred and fifty leagues four hundred plus one fifty plus two hundred plus ninety plus two fifty equals one thousand ninety leagues from the royal city of london towards the straits of mar mediterraneum and what happened on the way the ship wherein i was to make my voyage to constantinople lying at gravesend i departed from london in a pair of oars with my chest and such provision as i had provided for that purpose the ninth of february fifteen ninety nine being friday coming to gravesend i went aboard our ship called the hector and there placed my chest my bedding and a pair of virginals which the merchants did allow me to carry for my exercise by the way other commodities i carried none saving one gross of tin spoons which cost me nine shillings and thirty pound of tin in bars which cost me eighteen shillings the ship being very unready and no cabins appointed for passengers i was constrained to go into the town for my lodging and diet till the thirteenth day in the afternoon at which time anchor was weighed and we under sail until we came to deal castle coming to deal castle there we came to an anchor for the wind served not to pass by dover there our ship stayed four days for a wind in the meantime we went ashore into the town of deal and also to sandwich to make ourselves merry when the wind came fairer it was in the night and diverse of us that were passengers and also some sailors were in the town of deal where some of our company had drank very much especially one of our five trumpeters who being in drink had locked his chamber door and when he that came from the ship to call us went under his chamber window and called him he came to the window and insulted him whereupon we went all away aboard our ship and left that drunkard behind there the wind serving well we sailed merrily by dover and so along the sleeve the celtic sea but being about thirty leagues at sea suddenly there came a contrary wind the which did prove a marvellous great storm for the space of eight and forty hours in the night we did not only lose our pinnace called the lanaret the hawk who was to go with us to the gulf of venice but we also lost ourselves not knowing where we were by reason the fog was so great that we could see no sun when it began anything to clear we found ourselves to be hard upon the pony stones between england and ireland probably the dangerous pomier rocks in the casquettes a very dangerous place then our mariners did labor to get us into the main ocean again but the storm not altogether ceasing but the fog more increasing we were the next day at a non-plus again not knowing where we were but being under sail and the fog very thick upon a sudden we saw the sea break against the shore the which was very great rocks and we were so near the shore that it was not possible to cast about in time to save ourselves from shipwreck but it pleased almighty god so to defend us from harm that we were just before the harbour at dartmouth a very straight entry betwixt great rocks that are on both sides of that entry then were we all very joyful and entered in there very willingly there we stayed four days in the meantime the master the captain and merchants sent posts about to all the haven towns upon that coast 
to inquire of our pinnace the lanaret in the end word was brought that presently after the storm three or four sail of dunkirkers who were at that time the pirates of the channel had her in chase and in the storm her topmast was broken so that to save herself from being taken she ran ashore at falmouth having there gotten a new topmast she sent word by the messenger that she would meet us in plymouth sound this word being brought anchor was weighed and we under sail when we came right before plymouth a piece was discharged to call our pinnace but even at that time the wind came contrary so that we must needs also go in there and came to an anchor in that water where we found our pinnace there we stayed seven days for a wind end of section one section two of dallam's travels with an organ to the grand seigneur fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred by thomas dallam this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson the sixteenth day of march being very cold weather the wind came fair and as we were under sail in plymouth sound there came in a little caravel with salt who no sooner was come to the shore and hearing the name of our ship but they caused a parley to be sounded by a trumpet whereupon sail was struck and two sailors of that caravel came aboard our ship advising our master not to go to sea without good store of company for they went to sea in a man-of-war from plymouth called the plough and they were taken by seven sail of dunkirkers who did straightly examine them if they could tell where the hector was or whether she were gone her voyage or no but they protested that they never heard of such a ship some of these men they put to death to fear others what they did with the rest of their men they knew not they took their ship from them and gave six of them that little caravel to bring them home when our master and captain had heard these men speak he told them that he would not stay one hour for any more company than god already had sent him the which was only our pinnace and two ships that were going for newfoundland and for their own safety had made haste after us sailing forth before a fair wind our ship sailed so well that we could spare the pinnace our mainsail and yet the next morning our pinnace was very far behind about eight of the clock one of our main top descried three sail the which did lie close by our foreport a little after he saw four more which lay the same course and these were the seven sail which we were told of then we began to look about us our gunners made ready their ordnance our fights out and every man his bandolier and musket fights were waist cloths formerly hung about a ship to conceal the men from the enemy we had the wind of them and needed not to have spoken with them but our captain thought it not fit to show ourselves fearful or cowardly lest the wind should suddenly turn or scant upon us and our flying would encourage our enemies to come the more boldly upon us then he called the boatswain and bid him bear towards them the which he willingly went about so we bore towards them and when we came so near them that we might well discern the hulk of their admiral and of their vice-admiral and they came boldly upon us our master bid the boatswain show them a broadside for our mainsail was so broad that they could not see the stoutness of our ship for mayhap quoth he 
they may take our ship to be one of the queens and if we do happen to heal them or they us they which make answer may say our ship is called the seven stars for the queen as yet hath none of that name but as soon as they saw the broadside of our ship thinking us indeed to be one of the queen's ships they presently turned them about to fly away then we gave chase to them having almost lost sight of our pinnace and all other ships saving those which we gave chase unto they made all the sail they could and yet within half an hour we were come within shot of them then our captain bid the master gunner give them a chase piece shot at the admiral but hit him not chase guns were placed during an engagement at the chase ports of the bows so the master gunner gave him a shot close by his forebow yet would they neither strike sail nor show any flag but made away with all the sail they had drablings and top gallants but all would not serve their turn for we came nearer and nearer unto them then our master bid the gunner shoot through the admiral his mainsail and so he did very near her drabling drablings were pieces of canvas laced on the bonnet of a sail to give it more drop then the admiral vice admiral rear admiral and one more shot the main top but at that time they had the wind side of us though we were near come unto them yet no man would show himself then the boatswain of our ship stood upon our spar deck with his sword drawn in his hand commanding them to come under our lee side the which very unwillingly they did yet no man would show himself now we being very near the coast of spain he tacked about again to go his right course and all this seven sail did follow us then our master called unto the admiral himself commanding them to cast out the boat and come aboard us or else he would sink them after so calling twice unto them one that seemed by his speech to be a dutchman answered we will we will but long it was before the boat came forth yet at last their boat came forth and the captain of that ship with four sailors to row the boat went aboard the vice-admiral and there stayed half an hour then those three captains came aboard our ship now all this while we were sailing our course and all these seven ships durst do no other but follow us when these three captains came aboard us one of our company saw one of them have under his arm a good long money bag full of something and so they went with the master of our ship into his cabin and talked a good while in the meantime the sailors which brought these captains aboard standing on our hatches and our sailors looking upon them one of our men said surely i should know this fellow for he is an englishman that man presently answered swearing a great oath and saying that he was no englishman neither could speak one word of english and yet he spoke as good english as any of us then one of our master's mates our purser and boatswain took their boat and four of our own sailors and went aboard three or four of those ships and in that meantime our master and the three captains having well talked of the matter our master came forth of his cabin and strode upon the spar deck causing all our company to be called before him did read a letter which seemed to be but newly written 
the effect of that letter was as if it had been made as a pass from the king of france with certain wines which the captain said were aboard their ships but while he was a reading that letter our master's mate purser and boatswain came from the ships and said they were men of war laden with nothing but men soldiers muskets rapiers and daggers shields and bucklers and meant nothing so much as to have taken us but our master having already taken the prize in his cabin seemed to be very angry with his mate and the purser for saying so he having a letter to show the contrary so he discharged the captain and let the ships go the which grieved the sailors and the rest of our company very much if he had done as he might very well have done brought those seven sail as a prize into england it would have been the bravest service that ever any english merchant ship did and thereby have reaped great credit as any ever did the following paragraph was written in the original on the opposite blank page at our coming home out of turkey it was well known that those seven sail after they escaped from us and before our coming home they had taken and robbed upon the sea betwixt london and newcastle three score sail of english and other country ships end of section two section three of dalham's travels with an organ to the grand seigneur fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred by Thomas Dallum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. March 1599. The 20th day, the wind serving well, we passed the North Cape and entered the Bay of Portugal. The 23rd, we recovered the South Cape. Then we were becalmed for a time. The 24th, there came an infinite company of porpoises about our ship, the which did leap and run marvelously. The 25th, we saw two or three great monstrous fishes or whales, the which did spout water up into the air, like as smoke doth ascend out of a chimney. Sometime we might see a great part of their body above the water, the calm did yet continue. The 27th, having a very fair wind, the which did blow a good gale about twelve or one of the clock, we entered the Straits of Mar Mediterranean, in despite of our enemies. At the entry it is but three leagues at the most from shore to shore. In my thinking it seemed not to be above three miles, but the reason of it is because the land is very high on both sides, Spain on our left hand and Barbary of the right. On Spain's side we did see a very fair town or city called Tarifa, the which stood very pleasantly close to the sea. On Barbary's side there is a mighty mountain of rocks, the which they do call Ape Hill. Seven leagues further, on Spain's side, there is a very strong town called Gibraltar. This town lay very fair to our view. It is very well fortified and of great strength. There doth also lie a great number of the king of Spain's galleys and men of war to keep the straits. On the east side of the town there is a great mountain whereon a great part of the town doth stand. This mountain is very upright on both sides, but on the east side it is so upright that no man can go to the top of it. 
it stands crosswise to the sea on the fore end there is a strong bulwark by which means the town is more secure we set out from plymouth the sixteenth of march having then very cold weather and no sign of any green thing on trees or hedges and the twenty seventh at the entering of the straits the weather was exceedingly hot and we might see the fields on both sides very green and the trees full blown the which unto me was a very great wonder to find such an alteration in a eleven days right over against gibraltar on barbary side there is a town very fair to our view called ceuta this town is walled about and the fields about it very pleasant and of good soil though on both sides of sea there is huge mountains and ragged rocks on the east side of this town a little there is a large and strong bulwark or fort and the like is on the west side the king of spain doth also hold that town being in barbary a little further on the coast of spain there is a town called marbella but i could not well discern it for the fog which at that time lay upon the sea the next town is called grand malaga and then salobreña which town is forty leagues east of gibraltar the twenty eighth of march we sailed still a long by the shore of spain where we might see upon huge mountains great store snow that doth lie there continually and yet in the valleys below it is very hot the twenty-ninth day we sailed by the shore of africa the thirtieth day we entered into a harbor in barbary called algiers when we were upon the sea before the town it made a very fair show it lieth close to the sea upon a very upright hill the town in proportion is like a topsail it is very strongly walled about with two walls and a ditch the greatest part of the town or houses in the town have flat roofs covered artificially with plaster of paris a man being on top of one house may go over the greatest part of the town diverse of the streets are very narrow and uneasy going in them for the town stands upon rocks above the town upon the top of the hill there is a castle the which may command the road or a part of the sea before the town almost a mile from that castle into the country wards there is another castle the which is guarded or kept by a certain number of soldiers but as far as i could learn it is but only to keep the head of their springs of water which come to their fountains in the town for the turks drink nothing but water and they say that horse and man may go under or in the earth from that castle to the town i and three or four more went yet a mile further into the country where we saw another castle the which as we did think was made for the same use we went so far into the country at the request of mr chancy who was our physician and surgeon for the sea he went to gather some herbs and roots this day being the last day of march it was a wonder to us to see how forward the spring was trees and hedges were full blown corn wheat and barley shoot young oranges and apples upon the trees and coming again into the town we met moors and other people driving asses laden with green beans to be sold in the market as they went along the street they often would call to the people and say 
balak balak that is to say beware or take heed we saw diverse moors come in riding all naked saving a little cloth before them like a child's apron some of them did carry a dart others a bow and arrows there be also a great number of jews but the greatest number be turks the town or city is very full of people for it is a place of great trade and merchandise they have two market days in the week unto the which do come a great number of people out of the mountains and other parts of the country bringing in great store of corn and fruit of all sorts and fowl both wild and tame there be great store of partridges and quails the which be sold very cheap a partridge for less than one penny and three quails at the same price there be also great store of hens and chickens for they be hatched by artificial means in stoves or hothouses without the help of a hen the manner of it i cannot at this time plainly describe but hereafter i may if god permit they have also great store of camels asses asnegos portuguese for ass oxen horses and some dromedaries there be a great number of turks that be but renied christians of all nations some but most are spaniards italians and other lands adjoining who when they be taken are compelled so to do or else to live in much more slavery and misery but in process of time these renied christians do become most barbarous and villainous taking pleasure in all sinful actions but that which is worst of all they take most delight in and that is they prowl about the coasts of other countries with all the skill and policy they can to betray christians which they sell unto the moors and other merchants of barbary for slaves there are in this town great store of hot houses or baths the which they call banos and also cooks houses that dress meat very well the next day after we came into the road the king sent word to our captain that he should come unto him and bring with him the present which he had to carry unto the grand seigneur so our captain went unto him and told the king that the present which he carried to the grand seigneur was not only a thing of great substance and charge but also it was difficult curio and would ask a long time to put it together and make it fit to be seen when the king understood what our captain had said he would give no credit unto his words but kept him as a prisoner and caused me and my mate to be sent for when we came before him and were examined he found us to be in the same tale that our captain had told and then was our captain released and we discharged and the king sent our captain for a present aboard our ship two bulls and three sheep the which were very lean for they do think the worst things they have is too good for christians they are all in general very covetous and use all the policy they can to get from the christians lawfully or unlawfully as much as they may the turkish and moorish women do go always in the streets with their faces covered and the common report goeth there that they believe or think that the women have no souls and i do think that it were well for them if they had none 
for they never go to church or other prayers as the men doeth the men are very religious in their kind and they have very fair churches which they do call mosques end of section three section four of dalham's travels with an organ to the grand seigneur fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson of the further procession of our navigation we departed from the city of algiers the fourth of april sailing still near the coast or shore of africa Twenty leagues from Algiers there is a fair town called Delis, but we sailed afar off from it. We also passed by a little town called Buji, under a huge mountain, rising high and peaked like a sugar loaf. Some of our navigators said that at this place St. Augustine did sometime keep a school or exercise. It is thirtieth leagues from algiers towards the east on the same side the seventh of april being easter eve we saw very strange lightning in the sky or in the air it was very wonderful and strange for we might see the air open and a fire like a very hot iron taken out of a smith's forge sometimes in likeness of a running worm another time like a horseshoe and again like a leg and a foot also the thunderclaps were also exceeding great the seventh day we passed by a place called moratome the eighteenth by a huge mountain which is an island in the sea close by the shore this island is called zembra el jamur upon that shore over against it is sometime the city of Carthage, but some writers call it Carthage. About five leagues further we saw the cape or fort called Cape Bon. At the west side of it there is a great and large town called Tunis, by some people Thunis. There doth lie some part of the Turks galleys. The fourteenth we sailed by a famous island called Sicily, close by the shore of it this island they say is three score leagues in length a very fruitful and pleasant island it doth yield great store of corn and all manner of fruit at the west end there doth always lie at least nine galleys and at the west end ten or more near unto the east end of this sicily there is a very high mountain, the which they do call Montabel, but the right name of it is Mount Etna. In the daytime we that sail by it may see the top of it covered with snow, but in the night we did see many flashes of fire, to our thinking about the middle of the mountain. This brave island is under the king of Spain we did leave it upon our left hand then upon our right hand we saw another island which is called malta and that is likewise under the king of spain and is now kept for the quantity the master of the roads grand master of the knights of roads so that the turks can hardly pass that way a little before we came so far as malta we gave chase to a ship being the fifteenth day after the master of that ship perceived by our flag what we were and did see that three such as himself was not able to contend with us he cast out his boat and came aboard us and brought with him for a present diverse commodities some turkey carpets some quilted coverings of watchet woad dyed silk and two or three great pieces of salt fish that were seven or eight feet long and one foot square it was strange fish unto us we never tasted it for after he that brought it
had talked privately with our master he gave him leave to depart and to take all his presents with him but it much grieved our sailors for some officers of our ship went aboard that ship while he was talking with our master and they found by the purser's book that they had ten thousand dollars worth of spanish goods aboard but our master having received some secret bribe he said that the ship and goods came from Caios, where mr william aldridge was consul and other idle reasons and therefore he would not take anything from him and so the ship went away then we passed by malta the seventeenth day we gave chase to another ship of marseilles and boarded her but had little or nothing from her then we crossed the gulf of venice the nineteenth we descried land in grecia the twentieth day we passed by sovrano leaving it on our left hand at this port of sovrano there be two towns and a most singular good harbor near unto it is the island called sante but rather zante the same day we came to an anchor before the great town of that island the which they do call zante by the name of the island there is also a good harbor the town or city of zante is situated close to the sea and is a good mile in length behind it upon a very high and steep hill doth stand a large platform of a castle wherein doth live the governor of that castle and town he is called the providor within the walls of this castle is diverse other dwellers and many houses within that place the providor doth two days in the week hold a court and hear diverse causes as well of the greeks as of the venetian and italians for this island is under the duke of venice but he holds it under the great turk and doth pay tribute yearly or quarterly for it the greatest part of the people in this island be greeks and they do labor hard in planting and trimming the current gardens olive gardens and vineyards here groweth very little corn but from hence cometh the most of our currants and best oil there is also good wine their provision of bread beef goats sheep and swine and pullen fowls they have it from castle tornese in moria the which place is near the plains of arcadia where plenty of cattle are the provador and those which are next unto him in office whom they do call seniors of health would not suffer us to come on shore because we came from algiers where turks do live and we brought from thence some turks in our ship yet at the end of six days we had practique which is leave to come ashore the order there is that all those which do come out of any part of turkey having not a letter of health from some venetian or italian must remain either aboard the ship or in the prison which they do call the lazarette for ten days if in the meantime any man happen to be sick they must all rest there for ten days more and so still for ten days until they have their health whilst we lay thus for six days upon the sea before the town i took great notice of a little mountain the which as i thought did lie close to the sea and seemed to be a very pleasant place to take a view of the whole island and the sea before it it showed to be very green and plain ground on the top of it and a white thing like a rock in the middle thereof i took such pleasure in beholding this hill that i made a kind of vow or promise to myself that as soon as i set foot on shore I would neither eat nor drink until I had been on the top thereof, and in the meantime did labor with two of my companions, and persuaded them to bear me company. 
one of their names was michael watson my joiner and the other's name edward hall a scotchman the day being come that we should go ashore i challenged my associates with their promise and got their good wills to go with me before we went into the town this hill is called by the greeks scopo outlook it is from the town more than a mile but i gave our sailors something to carry us in the cock-boat as we thought to the foot of the hill but when we were set ashore we found it to be almost two miles unto it when we came to the foot of it by great fortune we happened on the right way the which was very narrow and crooked it was early in the morning and we were told two or three days before that no man must carry any weapon with him when he went ashore and therefore we went only with cudgels in our hands so ascending the hill about half a mile and looking up we saw upon a story of the hill above us a man going with a great staff on his shoulder having a clubbed end and on his head a cap which seemed to us to have five horns standing outright and a great herd of goats and sheep followed him my friend michael watson when he saw this he seemed to be very fearful and would have persuaded us to go no further telling us that surely those that did inhabit there were savage men and might easily wrong us we having no swords or daggers neither any more company but i told him that if there were diverse i would with god's help be as good as my word so with much ado we got him to go to that story where we saw the man with his club and then we saw that that man was a herdsman yet for all this michael watson swore that he would go no further come of it what would edward hall said something faintly that he would not leave me but see the end so we two travelled forward and when we came something near the top we saw two horses grazing with pack saddles on their backs and one man coming down the hill towards us having nothing in his hands quoth i to my fellow ned we shall see by this man what people they be that inhabit here when this man came unto us he lay his hand upon his breast and bowed his head and body with smiling countenance making us a sign to go up still yet then ned hall began to dissuade me from going any further but i told him it would not stand with my oath to go back until i had been as far as i could go coming to the top there was a pretty fair green and on one side of it a white house built of lime and some square the which had been the house of an anchoress who as i heard afterwards died but a little before our coming thither and that she had lived five hundred years right before us on the further side of the green i saw a house of some twenty paces long and walled about one yard high and then open to the eaves which was about a yard more and i see a man on the inside reach out a copper kettle to one that stood without the wall then i said to ned hall i will go to yonder house and get some drink for i have great need the weather was very hot and i was fasting but ned hall told me i had no reason to drink at their hands neither to go any nearer them yet i went boldly to the side of the house where i saw another man drink and made a sign to him within that i would drink then he took up the same kettle which had water in it and offered it me to drink and when i did put out my hand to take it he would not give it me but set it further off and then came near the wall again and lifted up a carpet which lay on the ground and there was six bottles full of very good wine 
and a fair silver cup and he filled that silver bowl full of a reddish wine which they do call rabola and he gave it me to drink and when i had it in my hand i called to my friend ned hall who stood afar off for he was afraid to come near here ned quoth i a carouse to all our friends in england i pray you quoth he take heed what you do will you take what drink they give you yea truly quoth i for it is better than i have as yet deserved of when i had give god thanks for it i drank it off and it was the best that ever i drank then he filled me the same bowl with white rabola the which was more pleasant than the other when i had much commended the wine and told ned hall that he was a fool to refuse such a cup of wine then he came near the house and desired to have some water so he had the kettle to drink in when this was all done i was so well pleased with this entertainment that i knew not how to thank this man i had no money about me but one half dollar of spanish money and that money is best accepted of in that country i offered to give that piece of silver to this man but he would not by any means take it then i remembered that i had two seville knives in my pocket I took one of them and gave it him, and the blade gilded and graven. When he had taken it out of the sheath and looked upon it, he called in a loud voice, Sisto, Sisto. Then another man came running, unto whom he showed but only the half of it, and then they began to wrestle for the knife. But he that I gave it unto kept it, and leap over the wall to the side where I was, and bowing himself unto me he took me by the hand and led me about by the end of that house and so into a little cloister through the which we passed into a chapel where we found a priest at mass and wax candles burning he put me into a pew where i sat and saw the behavior of the people for there were about twenty men but not a woman amongst them for the women were in a lower chapel by themselves yet might they hear and see ned hall came after but having lost sight of me at his coming into the chapel he kneeled down near unto the women but saw them not but they saw him and wondered at his behavior for after i had kneeled down i stood up in my pew to look for him and then I saw two women put out their heads and laughed at him, as indeed they might, for he behaved himself very foolishly. Neither he nor I had ever seen any part of a mass before, neither were we the wiser for that. The chapel was very curiously painted and garnished round about, as before that time I had never seen the like service being ended we departed out of the chapel but presently one came after us who did seem very kindly to entreat me to go back again and he led us through the chapel into the cloister where we found standing eight very fair women and richly apparelled some in red satin some white and some in watchet damask their heads very finely attired chains of pearl and jewels in their ears seven of them very young women the eighth was ancient and all in black i thought they had been nuns but presently after i knew they were not then were we brought into that house where before i had drank cloth being laid we were requested to sit down and served with good bread and very good wine and eggs the shells of them colored like a damask rose easter eggs and these made like an a la campagna country style roux for they keep it in the earth because nothing in there takes salt my fellow ned hall would neither eat nor drink anything but water 
yet i did eat one egg bread and cheese and i drank two bowls of wine whilst we sat there the gentlewomen came in and three of them came very near us and looked earnestly upon us i offered one of them the cup to drink but she would not then i offered to give them that tended upon us my half dollar but he would not take any money these women standing all together before us i thought they had been dwellers there because no money would be taken i presented my other knife of two shillings price unto the old gentlewoman the which she was unwilling to take but at last she took it and then they all flocked together and as it seemed to me they wondered much at it when they had well looked upon it they came all together towards me and bowed their bodies to show their thankfulness so ned hall and i took our leaves and went away very merrily but when we came to the place where we left our faint-hearted friend michael watson who all this while had lain in a bush when we had told him the wonders that we had seen and of our kind entertainment he would not believe us for he was ashamed and desired us to make haste to the town that he might get some victuals but we made the less haste for that and went to see another monastery near unto the place upon this mountain growed many sweet flowers instead of heath thyme and other good herbs and fine springs of water coming to the town of zante we inquired out the house where our merchants and other passengers were which was at the sign of the white horse but michael watson for shame would not go in with us when our merchants saw us they began to be very angry saying that they had sought all about and thought that we had been drowned or come to some evil fortune but i bid them hold their peace and let me tell my adventures when i had told them all the story they wondered at my boldness and some greeks that were there said they never heard that any englishman was ever there before it was then about twelve of the clock and nine of these gentlemen would needs go presently thither to see that which i had done and because i would not go again being weary for it was four miles thither they hired a guide and yet when they came to the mountain they missed of the right way and did climb upon the rocks so that some of them got falls and broke their shins but at last they got thither and the way for them by me being prepared they were bid very welcome but their guide had instructed them with that which i never thought on the which was that at their first coming they should go into the chapel and there offer some money as little as they would and then they should have all kind entertainment so very late in the evening they returned safely again and gave me thanks for that which they had seen the thirtieth day i went with three more having a greek to show us the way into the castle End of section four. Section five of Dalham's Travels with an Organ to the Grand Seigneur, fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred, by Thomas Dalham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. May fifteen ninety nine. The first day of May we saw there greatest traverses or sports that they have in all the year, for that day doth meet at the town of Zante all the able men of the Greeks, with their best horses and artillery, which is nothing but staves, to run at the ring or at Quinton, a game of horsemanship in which a lance is tilted at a target on a post. They borrowed our five trumpeters to sound when they run at ring the prizes. 
the manner of it was so simple that it is not worth keeping in memory in the forenoon they run quinton for a prize the afternoon at ring the second of may we departed from zante the turks which were passengers in our ship and came with us from algiers in barbary and were to go with us to scandaroon did somewhat hasten us on of our voyage and the wind being fair we set sail the second of may the same day we sailed very near an island called travail in which we did see a castle and in that castle or in some monastery near unto it there be always thirty friars and no women in that island neither any more houses it is low ground and level and a little above one mile in length probably the strophides the largest of which is still called convent island and has a convent on it of monks only the third day we entered in betwixt negroponte the mainland of greece and a fine island called cythera they say that in this island fair helen was born and from thence stolen away before the destruction of troy the fourth and fifth day having but a little gale of wind we sailed close by the shore of crete this island is fifty leagues in length we sailed near unto that high hill called crete where st paul preached and an old jew that was a passenger in our ship told us that on the top of that hill doth stand a brazen man holding a bow bent as if he were shooting against the east and he said that it was placed there by art magic before which time few ships could live upon those seas the easterly winds were so furious but since that time they have been as other places or seas are over against crete we left many little islands specially at the east end milos and antimilos the sixth day we had a very straight entry betwixt two islands at eleven of the clock and did run within a boat length of the shores they be very huge and upright mountains that which we left on our right hand is called casos a place not inhabited the other upon our left hand is called scarpanto and it is inhabited in this island there be very great store of fowl that in the night time do roost in the ground as our conies in england do sixteen leagues from thence is the island of rhodes but since that island was taken by the turks the rhodes the knights of rhodes hath been kept by the spaniard at malta the seventh day we saw the coast of caramania the eighth and ninth we were in a manner becalmed the tenth and eleventh and twelfth we sailed by the coast of cyprus having it upon our left hand near unto the west end we saw a town called paphos eight leagues further at cape gata we set a man ashore who was a greek and born in cyprus and there dwelled but having a brother dwelling in crete whom he had not in a long time seen he got passage in a ship to go to crete but the wind would not suffer the ship to touch there but carried that man to zante and in three months space he could not meet with any ship to carry him back again to crete when our ship came he hearing that we were to sail by crete he fell at our master's feet and craved passage in our ship thither so he was taken in yet when we sailed close by the shore of crete our master would not land him there but carried him to cyprus and set him on shore there the which i thought was the man's hard fortune and so he thought himself for he wept bitterly because he had spent so much time and could not see his brother whom he so dearly loved about ten leagues from the east end of this island in cyprus near unto cape grego 
there is a great and large town called famagusta it is a harbor or good port there doth lie the most of their galleys and other shipping the thirteenth day we sailed just to the east end of cyprus for the wind was very small the island is the most pleasant of any that hitherto i did ever see the shores be low and plain fields rising into the land still higher and higher that a man may see near twenty miles into the country where we set the man ashore we saw great store of wild swine but out of all question it is a very fruitful country when we were about the middle of cyprus we saw mount lebanon which is in assyria and but two small days journey from jerusalem the fourteenth having a fresh gale of wind we recovered the cape Canceli, ras el kazir the which is near undescanderoon the fifteenth we came to an anchor in the road before scanderoon the which is in the very bottom of all the straits as far as any ship can go the sixteenth day our master gunner two of his mates mr chancy our surgeon one of our trumpeters myself and my mate john harvey every one of us having a musket with powder and shot we went ashore and through the mountains there be exceedingly high so that no ship dare go within two miles of the shore for fear of not having a wind to carry them out again yet betwixt those mountains and the sea there be desert places thick woods and bogs wherein doth breed score of wild fowl and also wild beasts namely swine and foxes we having entered into these woods thinking to kill some wild fowl our minds were troubled to find out some pathway for fear of tearing our clothes and every two or three boat lengths we should find a man called a mountaineer lying in a bush having in his hand either a bow and arrows or else a piece the which weapons as we supposed they did carry to kill wild fowl but we having strayed some three miles into the wilderness we found a square plain the which was nothing but a quagmire and in the midst thereof was two mighty great buffaloes beasts bigger than our great oxen at the first we saw nothing but their heads and they made a great noise with their snuffling and in the end went running away which was a wonder to us for had it been an ox or cow or horse of ours they would there have been drowned whilst we stood watching at this we espied a great company to the number of about forty of the aforesaid mountaineers the which were gathered together and going about to catch us by enclosing us about the company being in that place we knew not how to withstand but only by flying away and the woods that were betwixt us and the sea were so high that we could not see the sea nor the mast of our ship but running at a venture through thick and thin thorns and briars tearing our clothes at the last we recovered a fair plain where we might see our ship and within a mile of the shore then were we glad and took our ease where we found a fair fountain of very comfortable water for we were fasting and faint with travel after we had cooled and refreshed ourselves we returned through the roadstead plat or foundations of the town or city of scanderoon so called by the turks but formerly called alexandretta there we might see great pieces of walls wherein goodly houses and monasteries had been which in the same is now nothing but bogs and ponds walls of houses and a castle so sunk into the ground with water about it that nobody can go unto it 
we did see there upon the walls of an old house very strange varmint running up and down at great pace some of them bigger than a great toad and of the same color but they had long tails like a rat lizards some of them were longer made and less of body and so many others of diverse fashions at another time my mate harvey and i went into the fields to wash our linen and whilst it was a drying we went to gather some fruit for there be great store of good fruit that is common coming to a white damson tree as we were a gathering we espied a great adder that was in the tree upon the boughs at least twelve or fourteen feet from the ground he was even ready to leap upon one of us as soon as we turned our back to run away he leapt out of the tree and run into a thicket of briars a great number of such small matters i will omit the eighteenth day our ship was to be unladen of such goods as was appointed to go to aleppo but that morning as soon as we were up we saw a marvellous goodly show of tents upon the side of that mountain stretching down unto that fountain which i spoke of before the which when our master saw he sent a boat ashore to know the cause and our merchant sent him word that he should not by any means send any goods or any man ashore until he did see all the tents gone for there was the soldiers of damascus a part of the great turks army that were going to the wars and if they did find anything on the shore that did like them they would take it as their own so at night we saw these tents a-taking up for by reason the country is very hot they do travel by night and not by day so for four days there came every night a fresh company and we kept aboard our ship every day there would come riding to the seaside a great company of brave horsemen with their lances some had their negroes to carry their lances and other weapons some said that they were sent forth to constantinople to which is twenty days journey from scandaroon the thirtieth day the french consul which is resident at aleppo dined aboard our ship the same day towards night our men began to unload our ship of such goods as was for aleppo for sooner they could not well by reason of the abundance of janissaries that passed that way and pitched their tents within one mile and a half of the road and it is a very uncomfortable place there is but three hostelries one italian one french and one english some little cottages there be made of reeds like a summer-house and two small tents june the first of june there was letters conveyed very strangely from aleppo to scandaroon the which is three score and twelve miles distance after i had been there a little while i perceived that it was an ordinary thing for as we were sitting in our merchant's house talking and pigeons were a feeding in the house before us there came a white cot pigeon flying in and light on the ground amongst his fellows the which when one of the merchants saw he said welcome honest tom and taking him up there was tied with a thread under his wing a letter the bigness of a twelvepence and it was dated but four hours before after that i saw the like done and always in four hours the fourth day in the morning there were pitched above twenty tents at the place aforesaid but the number of brave janissaries i could not learn because i could not be conversant with them or any that did know it the most of them were horsemen and every man had his lance and most of them his boy or slave to bear his lance 
and every man his bow and quiver of arrows and scimitar by his side not only their manner of shouting but their bows and arrows be strange in the time of our being at scandaroon our long boat went every friday to tarsus the city or town where the apostle st paul was born for that was their market day and she went to buy victuals tarsus is but sixteen miles from scandaroon and about the midway or somewhat nearer to scandaroon is the place where jonas was cast out of the whale's belly as the turks and greeks told us the master gunner of our ship one of his mates my mate harvey and i with two sailors which rowed us thither we went to that very place and there we gathered and filled a sack full of samphire which did grow upon those rocks End of section five section six of dalham's travels with an organ to the grand seigneur fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred by thomas dalham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson the tenth of this month we departed from scandaroon towards constantinople the wind being directly against us boarding it from shore to shore towards night we came near to a fair town on our right hand at one end of it there is a fair and large castle and the town is a great length by the seaside this town is called ayash about six leagues from tarsus which the turks do call bias for they do change the names of most towns the twelfth thirteenth and fourteenth we sailed by the coast and near the shore of caramania which is in asia the less the wind being nothing favorable we had great leisure to look upon the shores the fifteenth day we saw cyprus again the twentieth day we recovered to a cape which is one hundred leagues from scandaroon the twenty-third we sailed by castelloroso which is in little asia an island much frequented by greek mariners the twenty-fifth we saw afar the famous island called the rhodes which in times past hath been kept by christian knights but now inhabited by turks the twenty-sixth we sailed by the shore of the roads of the which we took sufficient view for the wind was directly against us we might see where diverse forts hath been upon little mountains this island is fourteen or fifteen leagues in length and four leagues in breadth the twenty-seventh we sailed by the northern end of the island and at the north end of the island and at the northeast corner of the same there is a town or city which for situation and strength i cannot give it due commendations this twenty-seventh day died one thomas cable who was under twenty years of age and son to one of the owners of our ship as we were to pass betwixt the north end of the island and the shore of asia which is but five leagues betwixt and the wind directly in the gulf against us and also we wanted fresh water and other victuals very scarce our master and merchants thought it good to touch at the town coming to an anchor near unto the walls of the town there we found in the road a galleon of the great turks the biggest ship he hath about one thousand ton a very cart a ship of no strength yet was she richly laden and came from alexandria we were no sooner come to an anchor but the turks began to come aboard us so that the very first day there came aboard us not so few as five hundred rude turks and likewise every day that we stayed there they ceased not the next day being the twenty eighth of this month the captain pasha governor of the town being gone abroad with their galleys on some great business the kia 
Turkish for deputy, who for the time was captain, he with the chiefest men of the town came aboard our ship, and she was trimmed up in as handsome manner as we could for the time. Our gun room was one of the fairest rooms in the ship and pleasant to come into. In the gun room I had a pair of virginals, the which our master gunner, to make the better show, desired me to set them open. When the Turks and Jews came in and saw them, they wondered what it should be. But when I played on them, then they wondered more. Diverse of them would take me in their arms and kiss me, and wished that I would dwell with them. When the captain's deputy had well viewed our ship, the captain and master of our ship, according to the custom of the country, did give unto this man as much broadcloth for a present as would make his captain a vest or a gown after the Turkish manner. And so they went away. As soon as they were gone, the steward of our ship and his men, my mate Harvey and I, went on shore to see the town within. When we came to the gate where we should enter, I looked well upon it, and saw a superscription, written or cut in stone, but I could not understand it, only the year of our Lord, when this gate was built or re-edified, and it was set down, Anno Domini, 1475. When we had entered this gate, the first turning that we could find upon our right hand, we turned up a very fine street to go to the walls. We there found mighty great ordnance, both of brass and iron, the which was made by Christians. Some great pieces of brass that were burst when the Turks lay siege unto the town. There were marvelous great pieces that were made of hammered iron, every stave at the least three inches square, and hooped about like a barrel, the bore so big as two men might creep in, both at once. A Greek that guided us about the walls told us that one of these pieces, being once discharged, could not be charged again and made ready to be discharged in less than two hours. This town is double-walled. Between the walls the distance of a pair of short boats, and the ditch is very deep, but dry. To be short, having passed round about the town without any contradiction or stay, only the time that we drank a pitcher of wine, which cost us but one penny, we made haste unto the said side, and so to go aboard. When we were without the gate, looking for our boat, we see it coming off from our ship. When it came to the shore, there was in it Master May, our preacher, and one that was appointed to be our ambassadors under butler. Quoth Master May to me, Are you ready to go aboard? Yea, truly, said I, for I am very hungry and weary with travel. I pray you, said he, go back again with me to the gate, that I may see the superscription over it, and set one foot within the gate, and then I will go back again with you. So we went all back with Master May to the gate. When we were there we saw afar off a fountain of water made like one of our conduits, with a fair bright dish of steel hanging in a chain, for the Turks drink nothing but water. I pray you, quoth Master May, go with me to yonder fountain, that I may drink some of that water, for it seemeth to be very good and I have a great desire to drink some of it. So we went all with him to the fountain, and every one of us did drink a dish of water. As we were a-drinking, there came unto us two stout Turks, and said, Parle Franco, Signor? Which is, Can ye speak Italian, Signor? So, quoth Master May. So, as they were a-talking, I looked about me, and a Turk sitting upon his stall, who did know me, for he had heard me play on my virginals, and kissed me aboard our ship, he beckoned me to come unto him. 
and when i came somewhat near him in kindness and some love he bore unto me he made me a sign to be gone and pointed to the gate and bid me make haste so to the gate went i as fast as i could trudge and my mate harvey and the rest of my company followed after as fast as they could leaving master may and the under butler talking with the turks for they too could speak italian a little and so could none of us when we were gotten without the gate we looked back towards the fountain but we see nobody there for the turks had carried master may and the other man to prison by chance we found our boat and sailors there ready and aboard our ship we went when we came aboard i went presently to our master and told him all that had happened when i told him how i had been about the town he imagined that we by that means had given some offence because it is dangerous for a stranger being a christian to take a view of that town and so thought that for our fault these men were taken prisoners what words did pass betwixt our master and me i will omit till god send us into england no man durst be so bold as to go ashore all that day and neither did any come aboard us the next morning a little greek boat came from the town aboard our ship with a letter from master may directed not only to our master and merchants but also to the rest of their company this letter was written so pitifully as if they had been prisoners there seven years showing how they were taken from the fountain and coupled together like as they had been two dogs with a chain of cold rusty iron and led into a dark dungeon their chain fastened with a staple unto a post where they must continually stand and neither sit nor kneel and every two hours were shaken over them whips made of wire threatening most cruel punishment and therefore desired that by all means they would seek some means for their speedy release or else that they might be presently put to death for they were not able to endure that miserable life and sharp punishment which was likely to be inflicted upon them if the ship did once depart our master and merchants were so wounded with reading this letter and pitying the prisoner's case and banishing all fear they resolved to go ashore our master and five merchants having made themselves as brave as they could they went ashore very stoutly to the captain's house desiring to speak with the kia the captain pasha his deputy who after he had made them to stay while he came unto them to know the cause of their coming one of our men that could best speak italian told him that they found themselves very much aggrieved that their men should be stayed as prisoners and not to be informed of the cause and likewise wondered how they durst be so bold as to make stay of any one of our men we being going with so rich a present to the grand signor and those two men which they had stayed were two special men one of them our divine and preacher the other the chief and principal man for the present this with other words they said to fear them also they said that if he would not presently deliver those men they would hire a galley and send to the grand signor that he might understand how they were wronged and hindered in their voyage without any occasion given to our knowledge the answer of the kia was this yesterday i was aboard your ship presenting my captain's person in his absence you gave me not such entertainment as my place did require 
you made me no good cheer neither did you give me a present for my captain our men answered the best entertainment that we could give unto you for the time you had good cheer we could make you none for we had nothing for ourselves our coming to this place was to have some relief here and to furnish ourselves with such victuals as this country yieldeth for our money whereas you say that you had no present for your captain you say not truly for you had so much broadcloth as would make your captain a vest but then said the kia i had none for myself and one will i have before you have your men then said they is that all the occasion that moved you to imprison our men and will the gift of such a present give you content that we may have our men yea surely said the kia and so this quarrel was ended here you may see the base and covetous condition of these rude and barbarous dogged turks and how little they do regard christians this city wall which is next unto the sea is marvellous strong and so fortified with great ordnance not upon the wall but their noses to look through the wall so placed that no ship can pass on that side of the land without leave within the town in most streets a man cannot trot a horse the streets lie so full of bullets small black and white paving stones made of marble and of all sizes from sixteen inches to three inches many other things concerning this city and island i do omit till my return into england but of all the towns or cities that in my life i have seen for strength i never saw the like end of section six section seven of dalham's travels with an organ to the grand seigneur fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred by thomas dalham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson now having redeemed our men out of prison the next day being the thirtieth or last day of june we weighed anchor hoisted sail and so to sea the first of july being under sail we entered the sea aegean passing by and amongst the isles of archipelago where is a marvellous company of little islands the second day we sailed by one of them amongst the rest leaving it south it is called stanco caos upon the north side very pleasant low ground where seemed to be not only store of vines but plenty of other fruit also we see a very fine town whose walls resist the waves of the sea within the town very fair buildings the which was never done by the turks though they now enjoy the same it was our hap to cast anchor before the town all night but in the morning we set sail the town is called stanco by the name of the island the third day standing upon the spar deck of our ship i told no less than sixteen islands which were round about us the fourth day leaving leros south we came to the island samos where that famous philosopher pythagoras was born this island for the most part is inhabited with greeks the wind being very contrary to our course that finding a fair road we cast anchor there where we might see a little town a mile and better from the shore the people in the town seeing our ship come to an anchor we saw them run into the fields and drive away their cattle with great speed up into the mountains also in the road half a mile from us was a little ship or bark the which they hauled ashore and carried away the goods that was in her 
but they took more pains than they needed for we meant them no harm and one hour within night we weighed anchor but the wind was so directly in the narrow passage we had to go betwixt that island and another that we could not pass but were forced to put in again at the south-east corner of the same island under huge mountains mount kirky at the west end of samos to my thinking it is only one pumice stone and of certainty all that part which was next unto the sea is a firmy stone and very straight upright the next day some of our men went ashore to see if they could find any fresh water and to cut down some firewood one of those men being a very bold fellow stole away from his fellows and went to the town aforesaid he presumed partly upon his language but the rest of his fellows came aboard without him and every one did think he was taken prisoner the next day about ten of the clock he came to the seaside and waved for a boat so when he came aboard he brought with him some hens and some bread and was half drunk with wine about two hours after came to the shore the captain of that island who was a turk and brought with him a present in hope to receive a better here doth grow a kind of grain or corn which they do call millet a small seed much like unto canary bird seed the increase of it at the least one hundred and fifty fold they make of it finer bread than of wheat the eighth day died one john canill servant to mr wiseman merchant who was also one of the owners of our ship the tenth day we weighed anchor and proved to pass our course but the wind would not suffer us being west and by north as it was before when we saw that we could not prevail against the wind we came round to that place where we did first anchor thinking there to get some better store of victuals and fresh water but being very dark before we could get into the harbour by the negligence of him that sounded our ship was aground the which turned us to great fear and much trouble a great part of that night yet in the end all was well but in the morning when we did think to have gone ashore we espied four galleys and a frigate which came stealing by the shore the galleys stayed a league off under the shore of asia the less but the frigate came into the road to see what we were and there came to an anchor the which when our master perceived not knowing what their intent was he caused anchor to be weighed with all speed and being under sail the frigate went before us and also the galleys for then our master proposed to go that way which before he durst not adventure for whereas we should have left this island on our right hand now we left it on our left hand and ventured to go betwixt a marvellous straight passage for such a ship as ours was even in the straightest place these four galleys stayed for us but when they see our strength and boldness they were afraid of us they had placed their galleys close by the shore so that either the beak head did touch the shore or else their oars might and yet had we hardly room enough to pass betwixt their oars and the mainland our master caused all our company to stand up and make as great a show as we could and when we were right over against them our five trumpets sounded suddenly which made them wonder looking earnestly upon us but gave us not a word so we dashed them out of countenance who meant to have feared us and we left them by the shore of samos being the eleventh day of july the twelfth day we descried chios 
the thirteenth we sailed by the shore of that island the fourteenth we came to an anchor in a road two leagues short of the great town or city of Chios, so called by the name of the island the fifteenth day in the morning our long-boat being ready to go ashore for fresh water which we stood great need of for in three days before we had nothing to eat but rice boiled in stinking water and our beverage did also stink the boat being launched three of our gentlemen passengers came unto me and asked me if i would go ashore to see if we could buy some fresh victuals, and i said yea with all my heart as soon as we were in the boat the master was told of it and he looked over the ship's side and spoke unto me for the other might have gone with his good will and never come again neither would he have stayed half an hour for them but they did know that he would not leave me behind so the master asked me whither i would go and i told him but to set foot on shore drink some fresh water and come aboard with the boat then he bid me come aboard again presently but the gentleman had me betwixt them and held me fast neither did i mean to do as he bid me well said the master i see ye will go ashore and the company that is now with you will draw you up to yonder town which you see and i will tell you before you go that which you shall find true in no part of the world doth grow any mastic but in this island and now is the time for it the commodities here are nothing but mastic cotton wool and wines you cannot go to yonder town but you must needs go through the gardens where these things grow and if you be seen to take one sprig of mastic or one pod of cotton wool or one bunch of grapes it is a whole year's imprisonment and there will be no redemption for you therefore do not say but that i gave you sufficient warning etc this island of chios is rising from the seaside some three or four miles and this town which we meant to go unto is two miles from the sea and it seemed afar off to be a pretty town with a castle in the midst of it when the master had told us his mind for the dangers we might fall into unawares then he said to me that if i came not back again with the boat when she had taken in water he would set sail and be gone but we feared not that for as soon as we came to land we went directly to the town it was upon the sunday and the people seeing our ship come to an anchor and seldom had seen the like in that country and likewise saw us come ashore many women and children came to meet us who wondered as much at us as we did at them we went on right forwards giving nobody one word till we came into the middle of the town under the castle wall and there standing still looking about us there came a greek unto us and demanded whom we sought for or whither we would go two of our company that could speak italian well who answered that our coming was to buy some victuals this man said there was a consul in the town and we must repair unto him before we could have anything so he went with us unto the consul's house the streets were full of people which flocked together to look upon us when we came to the consul's house we were to go up a pair of stairs made like a ladder at one end of the house without the ladder went up to a stage or scaffold which was on the back side of his house that looked right towards the sea where our ship lay at anchor the consul was upon this stage sitting at a table and with him there were six very gallant 
gentlewomen, and very beautiful. As soon as we came up, these brave women arose and went away, and the consul came unto us, embracing us one after another, and bid us very welcome. He caused the table to be furnished with a very fine banquet of sweetmeats, and but two little cakes of bread, our drink was very good raspis, raspberry. Whilst we sat there talking, the common sort of the people in that town came to the garden walls, for on that side of the house was the consul's garden, and the walls were of stone without mortar, and the people did so much desire to see us that they did climb upon the walls. The consul many times stood up chiding them and shaking his hand at them, threatening punishment. But the more he chid, the more the people did climb upon the wall, and the wall being overladen, down came the wall, making a great noise, the length of a pair of boats, and almost so much in another place, the which made the consul very angry, and he might very well have wished that we had not come there. Where we sat, we might see our ship right before us, and we see the boat go aboard with water. In this meantime, the consul had sent two men about the town to see what victuals they could get for us. At the end of two hours they came again and told us that they could find nothing that was to be sold at that time, being Sunday, but about a bushel of garlic, the which we were contented to take, because we would have something, and we saw that we were troublesome to the consul. So, having taken our leaves of the consul, he appointed one to carry our garlic to the town's end before us. Going down the ladder from the scaffold, upon both sides of the ladder did stand the chiefest women in the town, in degrees one above the other, to see us at our going away. They stood in such order as we might see their faces and breasts naked, yet were they very richly apparelled, with chains about their necks and jewels in them and in their ears, their heads very comely dressed with ribbons of diverse colours. But that which made us most admire them was their beauty and clear complexion. I think that no part of the world can compare with the women in that country for beauty. But afterwards we understood that if we had gone to the city, which was but six miles further, we should have been much better entertained, for in that city was an English consul, whose name was Mr. William Aldridge, a fine gentleman. But our master would not put in there, for fear of being put to some charge, for he was a very miserable and sparing man, all for his own profit, and not regarding to satisfy other men's desires, or to give his passengers any content. Being come aboard our ship with our bag of garlic, it was not so slenderly regarded, but that we might have had chapmen, buyers, for it, and our money again with profit. End of section 7 Section 8 of Dallam's Travels with an Organ to the Grand Seigneur, 1599-1600, by Thomas Dallam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. The same day, anchor was weighed, and we under sail. But we profited little, for before the morning we came to an anchor again, something near to the same place. The next day, being the sixteenth day, we weighed anchor again, and were becalmed before the great town of Chios, very near unto it. But our master would not suffer any man to go ashore. The nineteenth of July we came to the island Tenedos, the which is right over against the south end of the Platte 
or ruins of the great city of Troy, the wind being directly against us, and also a great current which comes from the river of Hellespont, the Dardanelles. We came to an anchor by the shore, near to that south gate of Troy. A great part of the gate is yet standing, with some huge pieces of those mighty walls that hath been. The twentieth day we weighed anchor again, but could do no good, for the wind and current was against us, and we came to an anchor again near to the same place. The twenty-first day died a boy called John Felton, who was born at Yarmouth. Also the same day I and some more of our company went ashore and saw some monuments in Troy, pieces of walls, escutcheons, and marble pillars. We, being come aboard again, two of the great Turks' galleys came by us, some rowing and some sailing. Because they should not come aboard us, our master caused anchor to be weighed, and towards night, the wind failing, we came to an anchor again. The twenty-second day, two frigates, which came down the river Hellespont, seeing our ship, and knowing her to be a ship from England, by her flag in the main top, two English men that were in one of the frigates desired of their captain that they might hail our ship. The captain was very willing so to do. The which our captain, or master, perceiving and knowing the frigates to be Turks, and because they should not come aboard us, he caused anchor to be weighed with all speed. For the Turks' condition is such that if they come aboard, the captains would have had a present or begged something. So by that time that they were near come unto us, we were under sail. Then the two Englishmen called unto us, and after some salutations, they told our master that there was coming at hand the admiral of the great Turks' navy, and in his company fifteen galleys more, and also showed how we might know the admiral from the rest. For his galley had two lanterns on his poop, and the rest but one apiece. And so these frigates departed. No sooner were the frigates gone, but we descried the galleys very near unto us, for they came down the river Hellespont at a corner by the walls of Troy. The sight of these galleys, to our thinking, was a marvellous show. They were so curiously painted with fair colours and good varnish. The slaves that were in them rowing sat all naked. As they were rowing towards Tenedos, the wind came fair for them, and then they cut their sails, and the slaves were covered with a piece of canvas that overspread them all. When the galleys were under sail, they showed much better than they did before. The sails were made of cotton wool, and one cloth very white, and the other very blue, and the masts of the same colors. As they were sailing by us, our master caused the gunners to give them three pieces, the which was but miserably done, yet being so near the walls of Troy, the echo was such that every piece seemed to be five by the report. Then the admiral sent a galley unto us to demand his present, and also to ask why we did salute him no better. The galley being come unto us with his message, our master answered that the admiral's present was cocked under the hatches, neither did he know what it was until he came to our ambassador at Constantinople. And for that there was no better salutation, or more shot given to the admiral, the reason was that he did not know that the admiral was there. If he had, he would have given him all the ordnance in our ship. This excuse being made, the captain of that galley, 
who did not come aboard us but sent a little boat to our ship's side for the galley durst not come near us but the men in this boat said that their captain might not return to his admiral except he carried him some small present then our master making diligent search in our ship he found two holland chests the which he sent to the admiral then the captain of that galley demanded a present for himself our master answered that he had nothing then he desired to have some tobacco and tobacco pipes the which in the end he had and so he sailed to tenedos where the admiral and the rest of the galleys were come to an anchor at his departure our master gave him one piece with the shot about two hours after this galley was gone the wind being very small and took us short right before cape janissary by some people called the cape of janissaries there i went ashore with some of our merchants where we found a little scattering village inhabited with greeks there we bought some bread and hens also there we saw more at large the ruins of the walls and houses in troy and from thence i brought a piece of white marble pillar the which i broke with my own hands having a good hammer which my mate harvey did carry ashore for the same purpose and i brought this piece of marble to london this cape janissary is about ten miles from tenedos now being come aboard our ship we set sail the same day and entered into the river hellespont seven leagues and there came to an anchor near unto the two castles called sestos and abydos sestos is in thracia and abydos in little asia these two castles are very strongly kept for the defence of entering the straits of hellespont aforesaid which is the way that all shipping must pass by that goeth to constantinople the twenty-fourth a captain of one of the castles came aboard our ship and brought with him a present diverse other turkish captains came aboard us in the time that we stayed there and also the consul of gallipoli being there by chance he came aboard us this consul is a friar and very fine gentleman august in the time that we stayed here for a wind we went many times ashore but what happened and what we saw at this time i pass over but our ambassador who was then at constantinople hearing that our ship had lain long there for a wind he sent down a chermagy a boat rowed by slaves to fetch up certain letters and also for us that were for the present in the chermagy came master thomas glover master bailey of salisbury and a janissary from constantinople to that place is near about two hundred and fifty miles the next morning being the fifth of august not only we that were for the present but also master may our preacher and other gentlemen that went to serve the ambassador would needs leave the ship and go with us for it was thought by our physicians that one of our sailors was infected with the plague the chermagy could not carry us all but master glover did hire two boats more we were in all sixteen with master glover and master bailey the sixth day we arrived at gallipoli and coming to the italian consul's house who is a friar he received us very kindly but our stay was so short that we had no time to see the city having fair wind we made haste to see again about the middle of the night following having no wind at all and our men weary with rowing we went ashore where we found three or four 
windmills and the walls of an old castle though it was very dark yet some of our men rode up and down till they found a little cottage where they got some fire others broke down an old hedge and so we made a great fire under the castle wall at gallipoli the day before at our going to sea we bought half a mutton and here we boiled the one half and roasted the other though it was but in a homely fashion yet we eat both merrily and sweetly our fire was so large that we had heat enough before the morning we went to sea again when it was day the wind rose so great that we were forced to go ashore and to haul our boats on land at a great town called relisea there we found wine and bread great plenty but some of our company did walk into the fields and entered into a vineyard to gather grapes but being pursued by the greeks that owned the vineyard they were not only in danger of receiving some hurt but also of losing their garments cuthbert bull had lost his cloak and one that went to be the ambassador's cook was pinioned his girdle and knives taken away but one master gonzal a very stout man redeemed those things again and made the greeks run away for he beat them with their own weapons but not in their own ground then the poor greeks made a great complaint unto the governor of the town who was then in our company and had brought us a sheep for a present he quickly made us all friends and master glover was very willing to make the greeks restitution for the hurt was done them the governor or captain of this town is a very stout and strong man of his person but activity he had none for some in our company did prove him many ways he could neither run leap wrestle pitch the bar the stone upon the hand throw the sledge neither any defence with sword or cudgel but if he did catch a man in his arms fathom-wise he would so crush him that he would make his heart ache and ready to stop his breath he being asked the reason why he could do none of these exercises he answered that turks would never practice the same that christians did at this town we stayed all night the next morning our captain master glover gave unto this governor or captain two or three pieces of gold called sequins for his love and good company for he was very willing to make us merry and loath that we should depart the same day being the eighth day we took our journey by land towing our boats by the shore ten miles in the afternoon we came to a town called hora for our boats was not able to go any further the wind was so high and the sea so rough there we stayed all night at this town but especially at the last before is great store of corn and vineyards very good also great store of silkworms wine a pottle for one penny but the inhabitants of all these towns are very poor the turks doth keep them so under levying upon the fruits of these poor people's labors all this country which we travelled through from over against troy or the place where we left our ship is thracia wherein constantinople doth stand End of section eight. Section nine of Dallam's Travels with an Organ to the Grand Seigneur, fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred, by Thomas Dallam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Sue Anderson. The next day, being the ninth day, we left our boats at Hora and went three miles further to a town called Canasea, but further we could not go anything near to the sea, for it is so hilly and full of woods, a very wilderness. So there we stayed that day and all night, ever looking for our boats, but they could not come. Our captain, Master Glover, when we had well viewed the town, and see that the condition of the people was not to our liking, he made a choice of a house for us to lodge in that was next unto the sea. The town stood upon a hill, and this house upon the very brink or end of the hill, being the height of St. Paul's Church above the sea, and we were to go up a ladder into a gallery that was made at the end of the house looking towards the sea, and there was a little door to go into the room where we should lodge upon the bare boards. For in all this time that we traveled, we never put off our clothes, neither did we find any bed to rest in. In this room there was not so much as a stool or form to sit upon, nor anything in the house but one shelf, whereupon stood two pitchers and two earthen platters, not one window to give light, but one little hole through a stone wall. We being in this town before noon, to pass away the time after we had made a short dinner, we walked down to the wood side, which is close to the sea, a wilderness or desert wood, which is put to no use, as we did think, by the side of it. There we saw diverse sorts of vermin, which we have not the like in England. Growing towards night, and remembering what hard lodgings we should have in our new inn, finding a thick, soft weed that growed by the woodside, every one of us that was there gathered a bundle of it to lay under our heads when we should sleep. Night being come, and our supper ended, every man chalked out his resting place upon the bare boards. Our janissary placed himself upon a board that lay loose upon the joists. Every man had his sword ready drawn, lying by his side. Two of our company had muskets. When we had lain about half an hour, we that had our weeden pillows were suddenly woefully tormented with a vermin that was in our pillows, the which did bite far worse than fleas, so that we were glad to throw away our pillows and sweep the house clean, but we could not cleanse ourselves so soon. Thus as we lay waking in a dark, uncomfortable house, Master Glover told us what strange vermin and beasts he had seen in that country, for he had lived long there. He spoke very much of adders, snakes, and serpents, the difference and the bigness of some which he had seen. Passing away the time with such like talk, the most part of us fell asleep, and some that could not sleep, lay still and said nothing for disquieting of the rest all being wished master bailey had occasion to go to the door to make water the door was very little and opened very straightly into the gallery the wind blowed marvellous strongly and made a great noise for the house lay very open to the sea and weather master bailey when he lay down to sleep had untied his garters a little, so that when he came into the gallery, the wind blew his garter that was loose and trailed after him, round about the other leg. It was a great silk garter, and by the force of the wind it fettered his legs both fast together. Our talk a little before of adders, snakes, and serpents was yet in his remembrance, and the place was near where much vermin was. He thought they had swarmed about him, but about his legs 
he thought he was sure of a serpent so that suddenly he cried out with all the voice he had a serpent a serpent a serpent and was so frightened that he could not find the door to get in but made a great bustling and noise in the gallery on the other side we that were in the house did think that he had said assaulted assaulted for before night we doubted that some treachery would happen unto us in that town so that we thought the house had been beset with people to cut our throats there was fifteen of us in the house and it was but a little house every man took his sword in hand one ready to spoil another not any one knowing the cause one that could not find his sword got to the chimney and offering to climb up down fell a part of the chimney top upon his head and hurt him a little another that was suddenly awaked struck about him with his sword and beat down the shelf and broke the pitchers and platters which stood thereon the room being very dark for it was about midnight others did think they were pulling down the house over our heads our janissary who should have been our guard and have protected us from all dangers he likewise doubting the people of the town and hearing such a noise suddenly he took up the loose board whereon he lay and slipped down into the vault as we were thus all amazed at the last master bailey found the way in at the door when master glover saw him come in he said unto him how now man what is the matter what do you see master bailey was even breathless with fear crying out and struggling to get in the door so that he could not answer him at first at last he said a serpent a serpent had troubled him when master glover heard him say so then fear was gone and he went to the door and there he found master bailey's garter ready to be carried away with the wind after we a little wondered at our great amazement for so small a cause master glover called every man by his name to see if any man were slain or wounded for there was sixteen of us in all our weapons all drawn and the room was but little every man being called we were all alive and but small hurts done at last we found our janissary wanting who might well be ashamed to make it known where he was but master glover calling him very earnestly he answered in the vault he could not get out any way but mr gonzal took up the board that lay where he went down and lying along upon the floor he could but hardly reach him to take him by the hand without much ado they pulled him up when he leaped into the vault being very sore frightened he cast off his upper garment and left it behind him in the vault but no man could persuade him to go down again and fetch it for the place was loathsome and it should seem that he was there frightened with something in that kind master bailey was so his garment remained there till the morning that he who owned the house did fetch it the next morning master sharp master lambert and two gentlemen more hired mules and took their journey by land to stamboli or constantinople the which was three days journey the same day when these four gentlemen were gone we returned to hora again where we left our boats and stayed there all night in the morning we departed and in the afternoon we went ashore at a town called eraclea otherwise relling betwixt this town and the sea upon a hill doth stand two and twenty fair windmills 
every mill has six sails they stand upon a straight line and of equal distance so as they make a very fair show when we were upon the sea we were at this town very courteously entertained where we made merry till midnight then entering our boats in the morning being the fourteenth day we came to celebria a fair and large town we went there ashore for wine and water but we stayed not so long as to see all the town here i see great abundance of muskmelons that were as big as our citrons or pumpkins sold for the value of one penny or three half pennies apiece the fifteenth day being wednesday we arrived at constantinople the sixteenth our ship came near to the seven towers which is the first port that we come unto of the seralia which doth join close to the city from that point or corner of the seralia unto the city it is almost two miles there our ship came to an anchor and the next day she began to be new painted the seventeenth we went aboard our ship for the present and carried it unto our ambassador's house in the city of galata in the vineyards of Pera, and because there was no room high enough to set it up in his house he caused a room to be made with all speed without the house in the court to set it up in that it might there be made perfect before it should be carried to the seralia the twentieth day being monday we began to look into our work but when we opened our chests we found that all gluing work was clean decayed by reason that it had lain above six months in the hold of our ship which was but newly built so that the extremity of the heat in the hold of the ship with the working of the sea and the hotness of the country was the cause that all gluing failed likewise diverse of my metal pipes were bruised and broken when our ambassador mr william aldridge and other gentlemen see in what case it was in they were all amazed and said that it was not worth twopence my answer unto our ambassador and to mr aldridge at this time i will omit but when mr aldridge heard what i said he told me that if i did make it perfect he would give me of his own purse fifteen lira so about my work i went End of section 9section 10 of dalham's travels with an organ to the grand seigneur 1599-1600 by thomas dalham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson the 23rd the king of fez came to see my work and he sat by me half a day the 27th our ship came nearer unto the seralia the same day the king of fez came again to see our work the twenty eighth the hector our ship made her salutation to the grand turk there called the grand seigneur on the north side of the seralia the grand seigneur being in his kiosk upon the wall which is close to the sea this salutation was very strange and wonderful in the sight of the great turk and all the other turks she was as i have said before new painted upon every top and ancient namely main top fore top mizzen top sprit sail top and at every yard arm a silk pennant all her bravery i cannot now relate her fights was out and in every top as many men with their muskets as could stand conveniently to discharge them 
anchor was weighed the day very calm and fair all things being ready our gunners gave fire and discharged eight score great shot and betwixt every great shot a volley of small shot it was done with very good decorum and true time and it might well deserve commendation but one thing i noted which persuaded my simple conceit that this great trumpet and charge was very evil bestowed being done unto an infidel there was one man sick in the ship who was the ship carpenter and with the report of the first great piece that was discharged he died likewise at the very end of this service another man who was one of the stoutest sailors in the ship and all this while had plied a great piece in the beak head of the ship as he was ramming in his cartridge of powder some fire being left in the breech of the piece the powder took fire and blew the man quite away in the smoke about three days after all his lower part from his waist downward was found two miles from that place and his head in another place when all was done the grand signor sent two men aboard our ship to see how many great pieces there was for he thought there had been four score and there was but twenty-seven the thirtieth day my work was finished and made perfect at the ambassador's house september the second day the grand signor desiring to take a better view of our ship he came in his golden caique upon the water and went round about the ship but he came so suddenly that his being there was not known till two or three hours after one hour after him came the sultana his mother in the like manner the third day our ambassador delivered a present to the vizier pasha at his house the fourth day the grand signor's secretary called the kapaji came to see our instrument the seventh day the bostan pasha the chief of the gardens came to see likewise also the head patriarch was expected but he came not because some turks dined with my lord that day the eighth day being saturday we began to take down our instrument for that day the grand signor went from the seraglia some six miles by water to another seraglia where the sultana his mother doth live for one month in the year it is tolerable for him to go to that place either in august or in september at any other time he may not go so far from his own seraglia except he be guarded with a hundred thousand men the eleventh day being tuesday we carried our instrument over the water to the grand signor's court called the seraglia and there in his most stateliest house i began to set it up this water which we crossed from galeta to seraglia is a stream that cometh from the black sea and is called hellespont which parteth asia and thracia and it cometh down by galeta a creek of that river the golden horn goeth up into the country about six miles which parteth the two cities of constantinople and galeta they may go betwixt them by land but it is twelve miles and to cross the water it is but one mile at every gate of the seraglia there always sitteth a stout turk about the calling or degree of a justice of the peace who is called a kia notwithstanding the gates are fast shut for there passeth none in or out at their own pleasures being entered within the first gate there was placed right against the gate five great pieces of brass with christian arms upon them then we passed through very delightful walks and gardens the walks are as it were 
hedged in with stately cypress trees planted with an equal distance one from the other betwixt them and behind them smaller trees that bear the excellent fruit i think there is none wanting that is good the gardens i will omit to write of at this time the way from the first gate to the second wall is something rising up a hill betwixt walls about a quarter of a mile and better the gate of the second wall was also shut but when we came to the gate my interpreter called to those that kept it within though they had knowledge of our coming yet would they not open the gates until we had called and told them our business these gates are made all of massive iron two men whom they do call a gemaglans did open them within the first walls are no houses but one and that is the bostan pasha his house who is captain of a thousand ajemaglans who do nothing but keep the gardens in good order and i am persuaded that there is none so well kept in the world within the second walls there is no gardens but stately buildings many courts paved with marble and such like stone every ode compartment or by corner hath some excellent fruit tree or trees growing in them also there is great abundance of sweet grapes and of diverse sorts there a man may gather grapes every day in the year in november as i sat at dinner i see them gather grapes upon the vines and they brought them to me to eat for the space of a month i dined every day in the seraglia and we had every day grapes after our meat but most certain it is that grapes do grow there continually coming into the house where i was appointed to set up the present or instrument it seemed to be rather a church than a dwelling house to say the truth it was no dwelling house but a house of pleasure and likewise a house of slaughter for in that house was built one little house very curious both within and without for carving gilding good colors and varnish i have not seen the like in this little house that emperor that reigned when i was there had nineteen brothers put to death in it and it was built for no other use but for the strangling of every emperor's brethren this great house itself hath in it two ranks of marble pillars the pedestals of them are made of brass and double gilt the walls on three sides of the house are walled but half way to the eaves the other half is open but if any storm or great wind should happen they can suddenly let fall such hangings made of cotton wool for that purpose as will keep out all kinds of weather and suddenly they can open them again the fourth side of the house which is close and joineth unto another house the wall is made of porphyry or such kind of stone as when a man walketh by it he may see himself therein upon the ground not only in this house but all other that i see in the seraglia we tread upon rich silk carpets one of them as much as four or six men can carry there were in this house neither stools tables or forms only one couch of estate there is one side of it a fish pond that is full of fish that be of diverse colors the same day our ambassador sent mr paul pinder who was then his secretary with a present to the sultana she being at her garden the present was a coach of six hundred pounds value at that time the sultana did take great liking to mr pinder and afterwards she sent for him to have his private company 
but their meeting was crossed. The 15th I finished my work in the Seralia, and I went once every day to see it, and dined there almost every day for the space of a month, which no Christian ever did in their memory, that went away a Christian. The eighteenth day, staying something long before I went, the Kapaji, who is the Grand Signor's secretary, sent for me that one of his friends might hear the instrument. Before I went away, two Ajemaglans, who is keepers of that house, took me in their arms and kissed me, and used many persuasions to have me stay with the Grand Signor and serve him. The twenty-first at night, it was a wonder to see what abundance of lamps there was burning round about all the towers of the churches, both in Constantinople and Galeta. When we demanded the cause, they told us that as that night Mohammed, their Messiah, was born, the feast of Bairam. The twenty-fourth at night, our ambassador called me into his chamber, and gave me a great charge to go the next morning betimes to the seralia, and make the instrument as perfect as possibly I could. For that day, before noon, the Grand Signor would see it, and he was to deliver his embassage to the Grand Signor. After he had given me that charge, he told me that he had but done his duty in telling me of my duty, and, quoth he, because you shall not take this unkindly, I will tell you all and what you shall trust unto. The ambassador's speech unto me in love, after he had given me my charge. You are come hither with a present from our gracious queen, not to an ordinary prince or king, but to a mighty monarch of the world. But better had it been for you, if it had been sent to any Christian prince, for then you should have been sure to have received, for your pains, a great reward. But you must consider what he is unto whom you have brought this rich present, a monarch, but an infidel, and the grand enemy to all Christians. What we or any other Christians can bring unto him, he doth think that we do it in duty, or in fear of him, or in hope of some great favor we expect at his hands. It was never known that upon receiving of any present he gave any reward unto any Christian, and therefore you must look for nothing at his hands. You would think that for your long and wearisome voyage, with danger of life, that you were worthy to have a little sight of him. But that you must not look for neither, for you see what great preparing we made, and have been about, ever since your coming, for the credit of our country, and for delivering of this present and my embassage, the which, by God's help, to-morrow, must be performed. We call it kissing the Grand Signor's hand, but when I come to his gates, I shall be taken off my horse and searched, and led betwixt two men, holding my hands down close to my sides, and so led into the presence of the Grand Signor, and I must kiss his knee or his hanging sleeve. Having delivered my letters to the Kapaji, I shall be presently led away, going backwards as long as I can see him, and in pain of my head I must not turn my back upon him, and therefore you must not look to have a sight of him. I thought good to tell you this, because you shall not hereafter blame me, or say that I might have told you so much. Let not your work be anything the more carelessly looked unto, and at your coming home our merchant shall give you thanks, 
if it give the grand signor content this one day i care not if it be none after the next if it do not please him at first sight and perform not those things which it is told him that it can do he will cause it to be pulled down that he may trample it under his feet and then shall we have no suit granted but all our charge will be lost after i had given my lord thanks for this friendly speech though small comfort in it i told him that this much i understood by our merchants before my coming out of london and that he needed not to doubt that there should be any fault either in me or my work for he had seen the trial of my care and skill in making that perfect and good which was thought to be uncurable and in some things better than it was when her majesty saw it in the banqueting house at whitehall end of section ten Section 11 of Dallam's Travels with an Organ to the Grand Seigneur, 1599-1600, by Thomas Dallam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. The next morning, being the 25th, I went to the Seralia, and with me my mate Harvey, who was the engineer, master roland bucket the painter and michael watson the joiner about an hour or two after my lord ambassador henry lalo was ready and set forward towards the seralia he did ride like unto a king only that he wanted a crown there rode with him twenty-two gentlemen and merchants all in cloth of gold the gentlemen were these master humphrey Knisby, master bailey of salisbury master paul pinder master william aldridge master jonas aldridge and master thomas glover the other six were merchants these did ride in vests of cloth of gold made after the country fashion there went on foot twenty-eight more in blue gowns made after the turkish fashion and every man a silk grosgrain cap after the italian fashion my livery was a fair cloak of french green etc now when i had set all my work in good order the agemaglans which kept that house espied the grand seigneur coming upon the water in his golden caique or boat for he came that morning six miles by water where i stood i saw when he set foot on the shore then the agemaglans told me that i must avoid the house for the grand seigneur would be there presently it was almost half a mile betwixt the water and that house but the grand seigneur having a desire to see his present came thither with marvellous great speed i and my company that was with me being put forth and the door locked after us i heard another door open and upon a sudden a wonderful noise of people for a little space it would seem that at the grand signor's coming into the house the door which i heard open did set at liberty four hundred persons which were locked up all the time of the grand signor's absence and just at his coming in they were set at liberty and at the first sight of the present with great admiration did make a wondering noise the grand seigneur being seated in his chair of state commanded silence all being quiet and no noise at all the present began to salute the grand seigneur for when i left it i did allow a quarter of an hour for his coming thither first the clock struck twenty-two then the chime of sixteen bells went off and played a song of four parts that being done 
two personages which stood upon two corners of the second story holding two silver trumpets in their hands did lift them to their heads and sounded a tantera then the music went off and the organ played a song of five parts twice over in the top of the organ being sixteen feet high did stand a holly bush full of blackbirds and thrushes which at the end of the music did sing and shake their wings diverse other motions there was which the grand signor wondered at then the grand signor asked the coppagy if it would ever do the like again he answered that it would do the like again at the next hour quoth he i will see that in the meantime the coppagy being a wise man and doubted whether i had so appointed it or no for he knew that it would go of itself but four times in twenty-four hours so he came unto me for i did stand under the house side where i might hear the organ go and he asked me if it would go again at the end of the next hour but i told him that it would not for i did think the grand signor would not have stayed so long by it but if it would please him that when the clock had struck he would touch a little pin with his finger which before i had showed him it would go at any time then he said that he would be as good as his word to the grand signor when the clock began to strike again the coppagy went and stood by it and when the clock had struck twenty-three he touched that pin and it did the like as it did before then the grand signor said it was good he sat very near unto it right before the keys where a man should play on it by hand he asked why those keys did move when the organ went and nothing did touch them he told him that by those things it might be played on at any time then the grand signor asked him if he did know any man that could play on it he said no but he that came with it could and he is here without the door fetch him hither quoth the grand signor and let me see how he doeth it then the coppagy opened that door which i went out at for i stood near unto it he came and took me by the hand smiling upon me but i bid my dragoman interpreter ask him what i should do or whither i should go he answered that it was the grand signor's pleasure that i should let him see me play on the organ so i went with him when i came within the door that which i did see was very wonderful unto me i came in directly upon the grand signor's right hand some sixteen of my paces from him but he would not turn his head to look upon me he sat in great state yet the sight of him was nothing in comparison of the train that stood behind him the sight whereof did make me almost think that i was in another world the grand signor sat still beholding the present which was before him and i stood dazzling my eyes with looking upon his people that stood behind him the which was four hundred persons in number two hundred of them were his principal pages the youngest of them sixteen years of age some twenty and some thirty they were apparelled in rich cloth of gold made in gowns to the mid leg upon their heads little caps of cloth of gold and some cloth of tissue that is variegated great pieces of silk about their waists instead of girdles upon their legs cordovan buskins red their heads were all shaven saving that behind their ears did hang a lock of hair like a squirrel's tail their beards shaven all saving their upper lips those two hundred were all very proper men 
and Christians born. The third hundred were dumb men that could neither hear nor speak, and they were likewise in gowns of rich cloth of gold and cordovan buskins, but their caps were of violet velvet, the crown of them made like a leather bottle, the brims divided into five peaked corners. Some of them had hawks in their fists. The fourth hundred were all dwarfs, big-bodied men, but very low of stature. Every dwarf did wear a scimitar by his side, and they were also apparelled in gowns of cloth of gold. I did most of all wonder at those dumb men, for they let me understand, by their perfect signs, all things that they had seen the present do by its motions. When I had stood almost one quarter of an hour, beholding this wonderful sight, I heard the Grand Signor speak unto the Coppagee, who stood near unto him. Then the Coppagee came unto me, and took my cloak from about me, and lay it down upon the carpets, and bid me go and play on the organ. But I refused to do so, because the Grand Signor sat so near the place where I should play, that I could not come at it, but I must needs turn my back towards him, and touch his knee with my breeches, which no man in pain of death might do, saving only the coppagee. So he smiled and let me stand a little. Then the Grand Signor spoke again, and the coppagee, with a merry countenance, bid me go with a good courage and thrust me on. When I came very near the Grand Signor, I bowed my head as low as my knee, not moving my cap, and turned my back right towards him, and touched his knee with my breeches. He sat in a very rich chair of state. Upon his thumb, a ring with a diamond in it half an inch square, a fair scimitar by his side, a bow, and a quiver of arrows. He sat so right behind me that he could not see what I did. Therefore he stood up, and his coppagee removed his chair to one side where he might see my hands. But in his rising from his chair, he gave me a thrust forwards, which he could not otherwise do, he sat so near me. But I thought he had been drawing his sword to cut off my head. I stood there, playing such things as I could, until the clock struck, and then I bowed my head as low as I could, and went from him with my back towards him. As I was taking of my cloak, the coppagee came unto me and bid me stand still and let my cloak lie. When I had stood a little while, the coppagee bid me go and cover the keys of the organ. Then I went close to the Grand Signor again and bowed myself and then I went backwards to my cloak. When the company saw me do so, they seemed to be glad and laughed. Then I saw the Grand Signor put his hand behind him full of gold, which the coppagee received, and brought unto me forty and five pieces of gold called sequins, and then was I put out again where I came in being not a little joyful of my good success. Being gotten out of the seraglia, I made all the speed I could to that gate where the ambassador went in, for he and all his company stood all these two hours, expecting the grand signor's coming to another place where he should deliver his embassage and letters. When I came to that great gate, I saw our ambassador taking horse to be gone. As I was making haste towards him, he saw me and came to me, asking me if the Grand Signor had seen the present. I told him yes, and that I had seen the Grand Signor, 
and that I had gold out of his pocket, whereat he seemed to be very glad. As he was speaking unto me, there came two brave Turks riding to my lord, bidding him take his place and stay a little. Then my lord bid me take my place a while, for he desired to hear more of that good news. So when every man had taken his place, there was a great gate opened on one side of the court, and suddenly there came out at that gate five hundred men on horseback, whose habits were strange to us, and their horses were very good. Likewise there came five hundred janissaries on foot, every man having in his hand a great cane like unto a beetle's staff, and they were also in a strange habit. This thousand men did only cross the court for a show. They being gone, there came six brave Turks, well mounted, to our ambassador, and conducted him to the water-side. When my lord was come to his own house, he, with the twelve gentlemen, entered into his chamber, and then he sent for me to tell him in what manner the grand signor had seen the present, and how I came to see him. When I had told them the discourse of it, they were all very glad that he did so well like the present. But my lord sat still a good while, and said nothing, until one asked him what he did study, on seeing all things proved so well. My lord answered him that he was sorry for one thing, the which was that he never had any thought of my coming into the Grand Signor's presence, neither that any other would make it doubtful unto him. For if he had but mistrusted it never so little, he would have bestowed thirty or forty lira in apparel for me. End of section 11. Section 12 of Dalham's Travels with an Organ to the Grand Seigneur, 1599-1600, by Thomas Dalham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. The last of September I was sent for again to the Seralia, to set some things in good order again which they had altered, and those two agemoglans which kept that house made me very kindly welcome, and asked me that I would be contented to stay with them always, and I should not want anything, but have all the content that I should desire. I answered them that I had a wife and children in England who did expect my return. Then they asked me how long I had been married and how many children I had. Though indeed I had neither wife nor children, yet to excuse myself I made them that answer. Then they told me that if I would stay, the Grand Seigneur would give me two wives either two of his concubines, or else two virgins of the best I could choose myself, in city or country. The same night, as my lord was at supper, I told him what talk we had in the Seralia, and what they did offer me to stay there, and he bid me that by no means I should flatly deny them anything, but be as merry with them as I could, and tell them that, if it did please my lord that I should stay, I should be the better contented to stay. By that means they will not go about to stay you by force, and you may find a time the better to go away when you please. October The second of October, my lord ambassador held a feast aboard our ship, and invited the bailey of Venice and certain Turks. The twelfth being Friday, I was sent for to the court, and also the Sunday and Monday following, to no other end 
but to show me the grand signor's privy chambers his gold and silver his chairs of state and he that showed me them would have me sit down in one of them and then to draw that sword out of the sheath with the which the grand signor doth crown his king when he had showed me many other things which i wondered at then crossing through a little square court paved with marble he pointed me to go to a grate in a wall but made me a sign that he might not go thither himself when i came to the grate the wall was very thick and grated on both the sides with iron very strongly but through that grate i did see thirty of the grand signor's concubines that were playing with a ball in another court at the first sight of them i thought they had been young men but when i saw the hair of their heads hang down on their backs plaited together with a tassel of small pearl hanging in the lower end of it and by other plain tokens i did know them to be women and very pretty ones indeed they wore upon their heads nothing but a little cap of cloth of gold which did but cover the crown of their head no bands about their necks or anything but fair chains of pearl and a jewel hanging on their breast and jewels in their ears their coats were like a soldier's mandillion some of red satin and some of blue and some of other colors and gridded like a lace of contrary color they wore breeches of scamanti a fine cloth made of cotton wool as white as snow and as fine as lawn for i could discern the skin of their thighs through it these breeches came down to their mid-leg some of them did wear fine cordovan buskins and some had their legs naked with a gold ring on the small of her leg on her foot a velvet pantoffel four or five inches high i stood so long looking upon them that he which had showed me all this kindness began to be very angry with me he made a wry mouth and stamped with his foot to make me give over looking the which i was very loath to do for that sight did please me wondrous well then i went away with this agemagland to the place where we left my dragoman or interpreter and i told my interpreter that i had seen thirty of the grand signor's concubines but my interpreter advised me that by no means i should speak of it whereby any turk might hear of it for if it were known to some turks it would present death to him that showed me them he durst not look upon them himself although i looked so long upon them they saw me not neither all that while looked toward that place if they had seen me they would all have come presently thither to look upon me and wondered as much at me or how i came thither as i did to see them the next day our ship called the hector being ready to depart i went to carry my bed and my chest aboard the ship whilst i was aboard the ship there came a gemaglan or a messenger from the seraglia to my lord ambassador with an express command that the ship should not depart but must stay the grand signor's pleasure when my lord heard this message with such a command he began to wonder what the cause could be he thought that there had been some forfeit made or that some of the ship's company had done hurt or given some great offence unto some great person but whatever soever it was he knew that the grand signor's command must be obeyed therefore when he had studied long what the cause might be and being very desirous to know the truth he went to the messenger and desired him to tell him the cause 
why the grand signor had sent this command or wherefore it should be the messenger told him that he did not know the cause why neither wherefore but he did hear the kia say that if the workmen that set up the present in the seraglia would not be persuaded to stay behind the ship the ship must stay until he had removed the present unto another place when my lord had got thus much out of him he began to be somewhat merry for he was much grieved before thinking it had been a greater matter for the merchants was bound in five hundred pounds unto the owners of the ship that she should depart that day which was the thursday following if wind and weather served also for the time that she stayed there her charges was every day twenty lira then my lord inquired for me and sent one to the ship where i was who told me that i must come presently to my lord so when i came to my lord i found with him another messenger who brought the certainty of the matter that it was for no other cause but for my staying to remove the organ but when my lord told me that i must be contented to stay and let the ship go then was i in a wonderful perplexity and in my fury i told my lord that that was now come to pass which i ever feared and that was that he in the end would betray me and turn me over into the turk's hands where i should live a slavish life and never company again with christians with many other such like words my lord very patiently gave me leave to speak my mind then he lay his hand on my shoulder and told that he was a christian himself and hoped thereby to be saved it was no plot of his neither did he know of any such matter as this till the messenger came in the end quoth he be you contented to stay and let the ship go and it shall cost me five hundred pounds rather than you shall be compelled to stay a day longer than you are willing yourself after you have removed the present and you shall stay here as long as you will and go as soon as you will or when you will make choice of your company and you shall want nothing silver or gold to carry you by sea or land and go much safer and more for your pleasure ten times than you could go with the ship for the ship goeth the scandaroon in the bottom of the straits which is out of her way homewards and there will stay a month at least to take in her loading and the place is so corrupt and unhealthful that many of her men will there grow sick and die and you shall by this means be out of that danger my lord did speak this so friendly and nobly unto me that upon a sudden he had altered my mind and i told him that i would yield myself into god's hand and his then said my lord i thank you i will send to the ship for such things as you desire to have left behind for you must go presently to the seraglia to see the place where you must set up the present or else they think that you mean not to come at all so away went i with my dragoman or interpreter my old way to the seraglia gates the which they willingly opened and bid me welcome when i came to that house where the present did stand those agemaglans my old acquaintance which kept that house and had been appointed by the grand signor to persuade me to stay there always as indeed they had done diverse times and diverse ways now they thought that i would stay indeed they embraced me very kindly and kissed me many times what my dragoman said to them i know not but i think 
he told them that I would not stay. Therefore, when I was gone out of the house, down some four or five steps into a court, as I was putting on my pantofles, one of these agemaglans came behind me and took me in his arms and carried me up again into the house and set me down at that door where all the grand signor's brothers were strangled that day he was made emperor my interpreter followed apace when he that carried me had set me down i bid my dragoman ask him why he did so and he seeing me look merrily he himself laughed heartily and said that he did so but to see how i would take it if they should stay me by force then i bid my dragoman tell him that they should not need to go about to stay me by force for i did stay willingly to do the grand signor all the service that i could then these two agemaglans went with me to show me the house where unto the present should be removed the way was very pleasant through the gardens where did grow store of cypress trees and many other good fruit trees in very comely and decent order being past the gardens we entered upon a fair green where we found some gallant turks riding horses on the east side of that green or plain upon the wall of the seraglia close to the seaside doth stand a pretty fine little building which they call a kiosk made for a banqueting house but especially as i perceived it is a place where the grand signor doth use to meet his concubines twice in the week it is finely covered with lead and builded square on the top in the middle a little square tower like a pyramid on a great height and on top of that a little turret well gilded and on the side next to the sea a fair large gallery where men may stand and see both up and down the river of hellespont and likewise over it into asia on the other three sides toward the green are very large penthouses supported with fine marble pillars the floor spread with fair carpets the roof under the penthouses very curiously wrought with gold and colors but coming into it it is a little wonder i cannot duly describe it but the roof is a round hollow very curiously a page of the manuscript is lost here pipes and laid them in order on the carpets by chance i called to my dragoman and asked him the cause of their running away then he said the grand signor and his concubines were coming we must be gone in pain of death but they run all away and left me behind and before i got out of the house they were run over the green quite out at the gate and i run as fast as my legs could carry me after and four negroes or blackamoors came running towards me with their scimitars drawn if they could have catched me they would have hewed me all in pieces with their scimitars when i came to the wicket or gate there stood a great number of agemaglans praying that i might escape the hands of those running wolves when i was got out of the gate they were very joyful that i had so well escaped their hands i stayed not there but took boat and went presently to my lord and told him how i had run for my life as soon as my dragoman came home my lord made him believe that he would hang him for leaving me in that danger but at last granted him his life but forbid him to come to his house any more he was a turk but a cornish man born now as i was running for my life i did see a little of a brave show 
which was the grand signor himself on horseback many of his concubines some riding and some on foot and brave fellows in their kind that were gelded men and keepers of the concubines negroes that were as black as jet but very brave by their sides great scimitars the scabbards seemed to be all gold etc the twenty-first my lord would not suffer me to go to work because it was our sabbath day and that did lose me something for that day the grand signor had appointed to come and sit by me to see how i put my work together and was come upon the green which when the agemaglans perceived they run to meet him and told him that i came not to work that day then he returned again and thought that i had kept myself away of purpose and therefore he would not come any more the twenty-fourth my work was finished end of section twelve section thirteen of dalham's travels with an organ to the grand seigneur fifteen ninety nine sixteen hundred by thomas dalham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sue anderson the twenty-fifth i went to that place again with the coppagee to show him some things in the present and to see that i had left nothing amiss and then those agemaglans were very earnest with me in persuasion to stay and live there the last of october my lord ambassador went to the vizier's house with all his train of englishmen for that day the vizier had appointed to end a controversy which was betwixt him and the french ambassador but the french ambassador seeing us go by his house with a greater company than he could make he would not come after us the which was little for his credit the two ambassadors made suit both for one thing and the vizier received great bribes of the french ambassador november the twelfth of november i went to andronople gate that is the furthest gate of constantinople towards andronople upon a goodly plain without that gate i see a caravan of the tallest camels that ever i had seen in all my time then we returned into the city to see diverse monuments the which i would not for anything but that i had seen them i have not time now to write them but of force must leave them unnamed until a time of better leisure this day in the morning i put on a pair of new shoes and wore them quite out before night but this day i took a great cold with a surfeit by means whereof i was sore troubled with a burning fever and in great danger of my life when i was something recovered by the help of god and a good physician it happened that there was good company ready to come for england such as in two or three years i could not have had the like if i had stayed behind them and they were all desirous to have my company my lord was very unwilling that i should go at that time because i was very weak not able to go on foot one mile in a day but i desired my lord to give me leave for i had rather die by the way in doing my good will to go home than stay to die there where i was persuaded i could not live if i did stay behind them of our passage by sea to volos in romalia my lord ambassador would have me to carry my bed with me and gave order for the carrying of it on shipboard and also that when we came to travel by land that i should have one horse to carry me and another to carry my bed and my clothes the twenty-eighth of november being wednesday 
at four o'clock in the afternoon we departed from the city of constantinople and galata in a turkish ship called carmesel in the which we had a discontented voyage the master and sailor were so barbarous the next day we came to the two castles called sestos and abydos where some of our company went ashore and took in as good wine as the world yieldeth but it was but for their own provision december the first of december we departed from thence and after seven miles we came to the ruins of troy and sailed behind tenedos leaving it on our left hand the wind being too large for our weak ship we came to an anchor at the island lemnos the same day at this place we were in great danger of being cast away the sixth day we set sail again having a fair wind but towards night we were becalmed the seventh day the wind being contrary we came to an anchor by the shore of romalia the main land of greece the eighth day the wind coming fair we set sail and entered the river the next morning being sunday we arrived at volos in romalia the main of greece not far from thessalonica the tenth we took horses and began our journey by land over the confines of thessaly the twelfth day at night we came to a town called zetun lamia being come to this town our horses and mules returned to volos and here we rested two days i may say rested for i am sure we had no rest in the night our lodging was so bad beside the great fear we were in of having our throats cut the best commodity we had was that we had good store of good wine and good sheep here we hired fresh horses and mules we were but eight men yet we had every day twelve horses four of them were to carry our clothes my bed and wine and victuals for three days for some nights we were like to lie outdoors, and at some towns we could not get any victuals. While we were in this town we were warned to keep close, for there were some of the Grand Signor's soldiers that were coming from the wars. The fourteenth we departed from Zetun, and having ridden six or seven miles, we began to climb the hills of Parnassus where we had all manner of ill weather as thundering lightning rain and snow and our way was so bad as i think never did christians travel the like the mountains were huge and steep stony and the ways very narrow so that if a horse should have stumbled or slided both the horse and man had been in great danger of their lives also we were dogged or followed by four stout villains that were turks they would have persuaded our dragoman which was our guide to have given his consent unto the cutting of our throats in the night and he did very wisely conceal it from us and delayed the time with them not daring to deny their suit and so they followed us four days over parnassus but our dragoman every night gave us charge to keep good watch especially this last night for they did propose to go no further after us and our turk whom i call our dragoman had permitted them that that night it should be done now after he had given us warning to keep good watch he went unto them and made them drink so much wine or put something in their wine that they were not only drunk but also sick that they were not 
able to attempt anything against us to hurt us for the which we had very great cause to give hearty thanks unto almighty god who was our chiefest safeguard this night we lay in a little village under a wonderful high rock though that country be continually cold yet the women there never wear anything on their feet they are very well favored but their feet be black and broad this man that was sent with us to be our dragoman or interpreter was an englishman born in chorley lancashire his name finch he was also in religion a perfect turk but he was our trusty friend the next day being the seventeenth we came to lepanta Nafpoktos, where our turk revealed all this unto us and these men we had seen but never more than one at once and he never stayed long in our company for he came but to speak with our turk about their villainous plot this day we had both winter and summer in the morning we did tread upon frost and snow before noon we came to the bottom of the mountain wherein did run a river so big and stiffly being full of stones so that we durst not adventure to ride over it but our turk riding up and down by the riverside espied two stout fellows the which were naked and more than half savage or wild he called them unto him and they unwillingly came then when he had talked with them he commanded one of them to take his horse by the bridle and lead him through the river and so he did having a great staff in his hand then the other savage man took master paul pinder's horse by the head and led him over and then sir humphrey conisby his horse and so one after another the river was thick and muddy and was no other than merely snow water that doth descend from those hills where it doth continually snow long before night we came to lepanta nefpactos which is a great haven town the people in it are turks greeks and jews but the greatest part be jews the second turks this lepanta is a good haven town lieth close to the sea in the rising of a hill and upon that hill is a castle the which hath two counter walls etc in diverse parts of this town are very fine springs of excellent water and some of them do drive mills the which mills be very strangely made for only one water wheel without any cog wheel or anything else doth turn the stone and will grind thirty bushels a day and upwards to make the like i am able to give direction about this town they make great store of very pleasant wines both white and red also here doth grow good store of currant great plenty of oranges and lemons palm citrons pomegranates dates and almonds and very good oil we lodged here three nights in the house of a jew who is by englishmen called the honest jew for he is very loving unto englishmen the twentieth day we took a boat and crossed the gulf of lepanta the gulf of corinth and the same night came to patras in morea all our way thither we were in good hope to have had great entertainment there by mr jonas aldridge an englishman who was consul there but he was gone forty miles from home to hang a jew by missing of him we were constrained to lodge at a romaic's house a greek's house in such manner as we did all our journey for though we had house room enough yet we lay in our clothes upon the ground saving at the jew's house in lepanta there were two bedsteads english fashion 
but those would not serve us all. At this place, Master Canisby was like to have cut off a Jew's head who railed against our Savior. But Master Paul Pinder and the rest of our company, with much ado, prevented it. This Patras is in Morea, either adjoining or a part of Greece. Here is a good port for ships, but the town is near half a mile from the sea, in the rising of a hill. A little above the town is a castle, but the town and castle are but of small strength. Here is indifferent store of current and oil, and great store of corn, for they do sell some to other countries that want, also good store of goats and sheep and other cattle. Because some of our company was sick, we rested here three days. The twenty-fourth being Christmas Eve, we proceeded in our journey through Morea, about noon we came to a river that we must pass through and determining there to wait for we ever had victuals ready dressed for three days we pitched and placed ourselves under the alder trees to keep us from the sun for though it was christmas eve yet we thought it to be as hot weather as we have it in england at whitsuntide and swallows came flying about us our dinner ended, we crossed the river and entered into a forest-like country, where we saw neither town nor village, but sometime a shepherd's hut. At night we found three little poor cottages. In this wild country, where we rested the most part of the night, and while four of us slept, the other four did watch, for we took the place to be dangerous to sleep it i was one of the four that did watch in the fore part of the night betwixt eleven and twelve of the clock we saw a ball of fire as big as a great football rising out of the east and did rise of a great height and did give a great light then falling towards the west the light and fire both was less and less Master Conisby was very sorry that he had not seen that fireball. At four o'clock in the morning, being Christmas Day, we set forwards. This day we could not number the herds of swine which we saw and passed through, and also herds of sheep and goats, and we were very much troubled with shepherd's dogs, the which were like to pluck us off our horses. This country is a part of the plains of Arcadia, the Peloponnese. About an hour we came to a village where we did think to have bought some victuals, but we could get nothing but eight eggs. When we were a mile out of this town upon the plains, the day before was very fair, but now there fell a sudden shower of rain the which came down as if it had been powered down with bowls, and no wind, but our horses stood stone still, and would not stir one foot. The shower lasted not above half a quarter of an hour, and for a great part of that time, for a mile round about us, we could see no ground for water. Upon a sudden it ceased, and the water was gone all saving some which lay in hollow places. Passing through this plain, upon our right hand we might see the sea, and upon the sands an infinite company of wild swans. Upon our left hand we saw high mountains. At night we came to a castle called Castle Tornese, the which doth stand upon a very high hill, possessed with a garrison of Turks, and is three miles from the sea. It is a castle that may be kept with a very few men. The way to it is so laid, ugly, that ordnance cannot be brought anything near it. On St. Stephen's Day we did think to have crossed a part of the sea to the island Zante, but the wind was so high that we could not. 
on st john's day the wind being somewhat abated we carried our supports provisions and other luggage to the seaside where we were in hope to find some boats coming thither we found a great market of swine and other cattle and so there is every day being fair weather the island zante hath all their provision of victuals from thence from this place it is but twelve or eighteen miles by sea yet we had much ado to hire a huge boat to carry us to zante for our passage and carriage of our stuff we paid seven sequins or seven pieces of gold which were nine shillings apiece here at the seaside we parted from our dragoman or the turk that was our guide from constantinople though he was a turk his right name was finch born at chorley in lancashire end of section thirteen Section 14 of Dallam's Travels with an Organ to the Grand Signor, 1599-1600, by Thomas Dallam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Our Entertainment at Zante Being come to Zante, we could not be permitted to go ashore, because the governors of the town did understand that we came from constantinople or out of turkey it is their custom to deal so with all strangers that come out of turkey if they have not a letter of health from some venetian or italian so by the judgment of the proveedor and the two signors of health we were committed to the lazaretto which is a prison for all such travellers and there to remain for ten days and if at the end of ten days any man be found sick when the seigneurs of health come to examine and see them then they must remain there for ten days more january by such means as our merchants who are factors there did use we had practique liberty the sixth of january but at our first coming we were in doubt to have lain there longer in this prison but we had a great favor showed us for we were not put into the ordinary prison but into a new house where never anybody had dwelt and it was close to the sea also the watermen which brought us from castle tornese was committed with us because they brought us in their boat and we were constrained to find them victuals for seven days for then the seigneurs of health came unto us to see if any man were sick master paul pinder desired that they would release the water men and ease us of that charge so they were contented that the water men should have practique or liberty if they would leap out at a window into the sea and wash themselves overhead with their clothes on the which they were very loath to do but master canisby drew his scimitar and swore a great oath that if they would not leap out quickly he would cut off their legs and made them perforce leap out and so we were rid of them many things which happened in the time of our imprisonment for want of time i do omit february we stayed in the island of zante forty and six days ever expecting some ship to come in there that would carry us to venice or else for england but the first that came was the hector in the which i went out of england and we did think that she by that time had been in england when i saw her i was somewhat sorry for i had a great desire to have gone to venice but yet i was glad again because i knew that in her was a sure passage 
and amongst men that did know me the twenty sixth of february in the morning we departed from zante the next day we had ill weather and the wind contrary so that we returned again and went in at argostoli in morea cephalonia in our company was the edward bonaventure and the swallow in that harbour we found the great susan of london a ship of three hundred ton and there was the royal defence of bristol the last of this month came in there the merchant bonaventure march fifteen ninety nine the first of march came in a little ship called the diamond in this country is very good muscadine and there is also some current this harbour is very good what weather soever blow a ship is without danger there on the west side doth stand a pretty town called luxury on the east a castle when we went to sea from hence we were in company eight ships being four or five leagues at sea the wind came contrary and like to be foul weather so that we returned again to the same harbour in the morning the wind came fair again and we set sail again the sixth day we passed the gulf of venice the which day the wind came all southwest a small gale so that we could not keep our course but as we were turning in the night the wind came fair at south and by east and continued the next day the ninth day we descried mount etna but there it is called montebel the burning mountain in sicily in the afternoon we came under the shore of the same land at the first we did think to come to an anchor because the wind was bad yet turning up and down by the shore we saw the watch towers make lights at the top of their towers to show unto other watch-towers how many ships they saw that were not their friends for there be of those towers round about the island so that if one tower do show so many lights one after another as they see ships it will go round about the island in a very short time if we had come to an anchor we feared them not but they were afraid of us yet doubting the wind could be worse or else no wind at all we kept at sea the next day we were so near the shore that we saw a great company of soldiers both horse and foot gathered together for all that towards eight we came to an anchor near the shore when the wind came fair every ship set sail before our anchor was up and weighed the other seven ships being under sail they gave chase to a spanish ship which was going to malta with wheat and when she saw so many english ships under sail she thought it better for her to go back again to sicily than to keep her course our ship being the hindmost of all the eight yet we outwent them all and took that prize there was but ten men in her it was but a small bark she was laden with wheat when our sailors had pillaged her our master gave the ship and wheat to captain cook a man of war we had out of her very fine white bread and good cheese in the night following there rise a mighty storm the wind at west at which time we were thirty leagues from cape passero southern cape of sicily where we were last at anchor this storm continued forty-eight hours that we were not able to bear any sail in this storm the prize which we had taken was cast away the thirteenth day being wednesday we were in sight of cape passero again being driven back again three score leagues and there came to an anchor again where we found a great flemish ship 
that night the watch-towers made lights as they did before the next morning we weighed anchor again but we were driven further backwards the second night after we recovered that place again this trouble we took to be a punishment for taking of that prize the next day being sunday and the sixteenth day of march it was very calm and extreme hot weather at eight o'clock at night we set sail for the wind came fair at east but a very small gale the next day we were becalmed betwixt malta and sicily the nineteenth we met with an english ship called the john and francis near the coast of sicily laden with turks and jews bound for alexandria the twenty first being good friday the wind came fair and brought us to the island of pantelleria one easter day the wind was directly against us and drive us back the twenty fifth being tuesday we met with rebecca of london and the green dragon of bristol the twenty ninth the wind being fair we passed by cape bon ten leagues from that we passed by a little island called zembra across from carthage a very high mountain also the same day by porto farina the western point of the bay of tunis the first day of april we crossed the gulf of lions our victuals being very bad i was invited to dinner with our merchants in the great cabin and being at dinner we heard the cry of a mermaid like as if one had hailed our ship but our boatswain forbid any man to make answer or to look out the second day the wind came fair the third day the wind being bad we came to an anchor at formentera one of the balearic islands where our boats went ashore for fresh water and stores not inhabited but with banished men there near unto a watch-tower we found a man lying dead without a head for it had been cut off by some turks as we supposed this island is very near a place or town in spain called the island of ivitha our ship did ride but a little from the town and castle which castle is very strong the sixth day being sunday in the morning as we were weighing anchor there came a boat from that town and brought our merchants for a present two goats oranges lemons leeks and onions and green beans lettuce and other herbs the seventh day we sailed by las calderonas and by alicante which is a hundred leagues within the strait's mouth there we met with two flemish sail that came from walloon the eighth day we were becalmed before alicante the ninth day we passed by cape palos near cartagena in the night following by cape de gata and in the morning we were becalmed before almeria a fair town in spain as it is said not much inferior to london we were in a manner becalmed all that day and the night following this day we saw great store of the spawn of whales whereof they make spermaceti it did swim upon the water as the whale left it upon the water it showed red but when we took up some of it in a bucket it was white and like grease also this day being a very small gale of wind a great fish called a shark of a marvelous length did follow our ship side by side with his eyes above water waiting for a prey for if a man had come within his length of the water he would hardly have escaped him our master gunner made ready his harpoon iron and when the subtle fish see him ready to pitch it at him he stalled and fell behind the ship and came up on the other side 
and served him so two or three times. But at last he hit him a little behind the head with a full blow. But his skin was so hard that the iron turned double and would not enter anything at all. Only we might see a little white spot where it light. Neither did the fish make any show of feeling it, but turned him about and went away directly from the ship. The eleventh day, the wind being much against us, as we were turning to get something of the wind, we came near unto the castle de Ferro in Spain, and very near unto the shore, we looking still when the castle would shout at us, but they would not. Then, being come less than a league from the shore, we had no wind at all, and so it continued all the next day. By this means our fleet were scattered one a league from another, so that if the Spanish galleys had come forth, they might have taken us one after another. That day it was strange to see how the porpoises did run in great fleets or shoals, in what manner it is credible to report, and the noise that they made. The thirteenth we met with a ship of Yarmouth. The fifteenth we came near to Gibraltar, where we met with three Englishmen, or ships, and one Flemish which made our fleet fourteen sail. But the wind was so contrary that we could not come near the gate of the strait's mouth, but lay becalmed unto Burgo, also to Marbella and Grand Malaga. The sixteenth we were becalmed. The next morning we saw two great whales, which were so huge that we thought them to be two galleys or frigates. It was an extreme hot day. The seventeenth, at ten o'clock, the wind came fair at northeast, so that about eleven of the clock at night we entered into the narrow gate, which is four leagues in length. At the sun rising, we passed by Cape Spartel, near Tangiers, which is ten leagues without the strait's mouth, at which time we had in our sight twenty-one sail of ships. The same day, towards night, one ship in our company, called the Rebecca, the which at that time was the most speedy of sail, took her leave of us, with an intent to bring the first news into England of our safe coming homewards. The next morning, being the nineteenth, we descried Mount Guidos, a high land in Spain, seven leagues from the South Cape, behind Algeciras. The twentieth in the morning, being Sunday, very early, one in our main top saw a sail coming towards us directly, and when we might well discern the hull of her, we did know her to be the Rebecca, the same ship that took her leave of us two days before, to carry news of our safe coming homewards. The cause of the return of that ship was for that two galleons of Spain did give chase unto her, yet nothing so good of sail as she. But the master of the Rebecca thought them to be carricks coming from the Indies laden with great wealth, wherein he was much deceived for they were two men of war that did lie in wait for our ship, as afterwards they confessed. When they were come near unto us, we did also think them to be but coming from the Indies. One of them was a ship of one thousand two hundred ton, the other eight hundred. Our master was very unwilling to fight with them, but our sailors was very desirous. So we presently went to prayers, and then our gunners made ready their ordnance, fights out, and every man his place appointed, and all things in readiness, we having the wind of the Spanish ships. Our ship, called the Hector, 
lay side by side to the great galleon and another english ship called the great susan lay close by the other ever expecting who would give the first shot all the other ships that were before in our company were gone a league and more off from us without danger of any shot there was great odds betwixt our ship that ship was called the great susan here some pages are missing from the manuscript these pages doubtless relate the battle which as the sequel shows was a victory for the english unto him and desired him to give me and my mate harvey leave to go ashore there and we would take post horse and make what speed we could to london so at last he granted me and three more leave to go upon condition that we would take the spanish captain with us and bring him safe unto the merchants the which we promised to do then we went ashore at dover and our trumpets sounding all the way before us into the town where we made ourselves as merry as we could being very glad that we were once again upon english ground after dinner there came into the town a french ambassador being accompanied with diverse knights and gentlemen of kent so at two of the clock we took post horse to canterbury and from thence to rochester that night and the next day to london End of section 14 End of Dallam's Travels with an Organ to the